No, it's not only about the game, it's about the camaraderie. And what you've done is cast aside the camaraderie. We're a club level. Are you really? I've got it from a club level. Last time we were in the Raptors. Well, that's what we're saying. Yeah, what are you doing? That's the kicker. Yeah, let me think about that. I don't know. Could I ask my wife? She was going to be at a bar tomorrow? Right. Uh, she'll be at the game tonight. Oh, I think we're going to be at the game tonight. She'll be at the game tonight. She'll be at the game tonight. consider um, fairly easy matters out of the way first, so we're not going to actually follow the uh, agenda uh, as printed. Um, the first uh, item, one, call for public comment. Is there any public comment this morning? All right, no public comment. Agenda item two, approval of the minutes of April 20th, 2018. Is there a motion to approve the minutes as submitted? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, they're approved. Um, three, chair's report, that's me. Um, for the sake of um, keeping our meeting moving, we have a lot of items on today's agenda. Um, I have two matters, um, and they're articles that I saw in the Daily Journal. Um, the first one um, dealt with two lawyers that filed bankruptcy and then had state bar disciplinary proceedings. Um, one of which was um, Ms. Shearer, and apparently she settled her matter with the state bar, which is a matter of public record. So I'm going to pass um, that around if you want to read it. And the second one was an article about how to um, deal with a fee dispute, um, and an option that this author discussed was MFA, and it was interesting to note that he thought that malpractice claims could not be brought into the proceeding. So go figure. So I'll, I'll pass these around if you want to um, take a look at them. All right, item four, report from the presiding arbitrator, Ken. Uh, not much to report. I was out of action with eye surgery for a good chunk of this period. I think we're just about to file a motion. I've got several pending, uh, a motion for an action enrollment. I've got several pending motions. Um, don't think that it would be proper for me to discuss the substance of those since we're on a live feed here. So um, I'll just say that I have several pending motions that I'll be moving on to. All right, moving right along. They will be done um, by noon. <laughs> 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 Item five report from State Bar staff. Isabel. We want to start with the appendix I report. That's actually a different item on the agenda, but we can move it, that up. And we we have um, two guests, um, and they both are involved in appendix I. So let's jump to that item on the agenda. Um, item F. Item F. Best status of CMFA um, review. So. Um, Maybe if Dag and Richard can um, introduce themselves again, and I don't know who's going to start with the presentation, but take it away. Um, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm Dag McLeod. I'm the Chief of Mission Advancement here at the State Bar. Um, I'm joined by Richard Schaffler, a Principal Analyst in the Office of Research and Institutional Accountability, also here at the Bar. Um, 
we've uh, been working, and Richard in particular has been uh, our lead staff on what's become affectionately known as the Appendix I Subentity Review. Um, this review grew out of the Governance and the Public Interest Task Force in 2017. Uh, the Governance and the Public Interest Task Force, as mandated in the Business and Professions Code, um, examined the organizational structure, the processes, the functioning of the State Bar, and came up with recommendations and direction for State Bar staff um, to follow. And the Appendix I Subentity Review grew out of that report and specifically charged State Bar staff with examining all of what we refer to as the sub-entities. Um, <clears throat> currently about 10, depending upon how you count them, but looking at uh, the committee bar examiner, the board of legal specialization, the um, camp, uh, law school council, the, um, the accreditation process for um, law schools, the Committee on Mandatory Fee Arbitration, the Lawyer Assistance Program and uh, Oversight Committee. So it's a, it's a large effort. It's been underway for about six months that we've been um, examining all of the sub-entities. And um, what I wanted to do today is I wanted to first listen some feedback in terms of um, some material that we um, provided to Lorraine and to Joel, and I think that they distributed to the entire group. Correct. Um, we provided a descriptive overview, um, our, our effort to simply capture you know, the, the um, facts about the mandatory fee arbitration commission. And um, I wanted to make sure that um, I, I solicited any feedback that, might, uh, that you might have for us about that write-up, um, if you have any, and if you, if you wanted some opportunity to maybe send some, that's also still an option if you, if you want to contact us by email if you hadn't had a chance or prepared uh, because maybe that wasn't what you expected in terms of this update. Please don't hesitate to contact us directly and send us email. So part of this presentation is I simply wanted to solicit feedback. The other part though is I wanted to provide you an overview and a status update of where we are on the um, Appendix I Sub-Entity Review. Um, so before moving to the status update and providing some context for where we are on the on the review, um, are there any uh, questions or comments regarding, well, it doesn't even necessarily have to be on the write-up. Any questions, comments about what I've said so far or the larger process of the Appendix I Sub-Entity Review? Is this Appendix in our um, agenda materials? No, and, what and page is it on? Yeah, I was just gonna, um, Ken just asked me that question. Oh. Um, it, it, the report came to us, it was sent out to all of you asking for you to send your comments back to Isabel. I don't think people did, but we were told that because it was a draft, and correct me if I'm wrong, Richard, that we should not include it in the agenda. So that's why it's not in your materials, but it was sent out on an email from Isabel to all of us asking for comments, I believe, by May 31st. Yeah, I have that, but I just didn't know if we could talk about it under Fab and Keen. Well, that's why the comments are supposed to go to Isabel. And I don't think anybody, Isabel can speak for this, but I don't think anybody sent um, comments back to her. Oh, so I this, sent at the meeting, sorry. Yeah, this is our time, you know, to provide feedback. Uh, I don't think there are any prohibitions under Bagley Keen about discussing it in open session. Okay, so we're discussing the thing that was sent to us privately. Is that where we are? Correct. Okay. What date was that sent out? 611 is when I got it. Yes, that's yeah. right. Okay. And uh, I did respond because I wasn't sure what we were supposed to do with it. I had a bunch of notes and then I wrote to Isabel yeah. and I go. And I thought I thought we we're going to get everybody's feedback in a um, you know, document. Uh, but, you know, here we are. So, okay. <clears throat> if you wouldn't mind, if you have comments, I think this is the the time to provide them, especially when we have the two people here from the state bar that are running it. Well, and it's, and it's certainly also not too late to send them in and, and we can work with Isabel to make sure that we have them available for our. Right, so who wants to start with their, their comments? I just have a question. Sure, Carol. Um, I heard that um, there's some kind of a proposal to put this committee as a subcommittee under COPRAC, and I was just wondering about what is the, you know, what is the thinking about that, and I, I was on COPRAC for six years, so I, I can guess 
but I thought maybe you guys could give us some insight on that. I, I have heard that as well. That was actually on the end of the report. Richard put um, <coughs> some suggestions for discussion, and that was one of them. When um, I met with Richard here at the State Bar, Joel, um, hopefully Joel's recovering from his heart attack, but he couldn't uh, come. One of the issues that was brought up was um, a portion of our responsibilities is to prepare the arbitration advisories. And I think Donna had asked me, um, COPRAC you know, puts out a lot of uh, advisories or opinions. <coughs> and you know, would that be a function that, that COPRAC took over? My response was, MFA is so specialized, um, and we deal with what I consider in the trenches world, world, world situations where, you know, Carol, maybe you can provide some input, but I think COPRAC, I, I look at their opinions as sort of theoretical, what if this happens, you know, client A, B, um, what's the conclusion? So I didn't think that, you know, we have so much subject matter um, expertise. Um, if you look at all of us, I sent to Richard um, an outline of all of our experience. I think the least experience was 25 years, and you multiply that by 16 of us. And I don't think you could translate into that experience on COPRAC, not to cast you know, shade on that committee, but I think we're specialists. So I didn't think that that was a, a good um, suggestion that we would be a subcommittee of COPRAC. That's my take on it. Joel? Yeah, to follow up, I guess putting it in simple terms, the focus of COPRAC is how things should be. Our focus is to teach people how to deal with what it is and make the right decisions for the litigants who come before mandatory fee arbitration. Yeah, and that's basically what it's like. So we're in the trenches and dealing with real world problems. Carol? Well, um, a couple things. First of all, a lot of the COPRAC opinions, at least in the six years I was on it, were generated from the public or from inquiries or from the ethics hotline who would report to us, we got you know hundreds of calls on this topic. Okay. Maybe we should write something on it. So, um, I, but I don't. I don't think that necessarily means anything about whether you know this should be combined with COPRAC somehow. The one thing that I was interested in is that they are doing distance learning delivery, and you know I've advocated that for this committee. I do understand that so far this committee hasn't wanted to do that, but I think there might be some synergy there where we could provide some um, training of arbitrators, especially in remote or more remote locations um, through distance learning um, delivery. And if COPRAC's already gonna be doing that, if we could piggyback or collaborate with them on it, that might help us address arbitrator training. And that, that was sort of exactly the thing. I and mean, as the board is scanning uh, this, and this will become clear, Dag sort of this broad overview of all the different sub entities need 254 volunteers to serve on them. Um, looking for what are the functions that are common to some of them, and how might we professionalize, streamline, take advantage of? You know, some, some of them are proficient in some of those things, like the example you just pointed out. So, is there a way? And I don't think this was envisioned, at least when I've heard it discussed, that that would be done without members of this. The, in a sense, the idea was members of that some subgroup of this committee would have seats in that body such that the expertise of subject matter knowledge would be brought to bear on, on those things. So that's, it's, it's a not real specific idea, but the, you're right about the general thrust and what the thinking was about how to take advantage of and not duplicate in terms of the investment made already in it, educational technology that they've already made. Um. Yeah, I think on that issue, um, the, the committee, if I could summarize, our, our thoughts was um, because we have a symbiotic relationship with um, 30 to 40 local bars, depending on who has a program on any given day, 
um, the way that we touch the local bars is through our training and we establish a relationships which in my opinion it's hard to establish a relationship with a particular program or individuals at a program including the program administrators if we have a webcast and I'm not saying that that webcast doesn't have its um, um, advantages especially in this day and age um, but to uh, you know solely rely on webcast which I think would hurt our relationship with the local bars and we also use it as a recruiting um, device or function um, when we meet people at local bars and um, some of them just come for the free MCLE we actually get people coming up to us and saying you know learned a lot loved your program we have probably the highest rated program I've ever attended in my 36 years of practice and then they want to sign up to be an arbitrator which you know is, is something that we, we really need. We need more people coming in to serve and volunteer their time to hear these arbitrations. So, um, Ani, did you have, um, you want to summarize your um, No, because, again? sorry, uh, I kept those on my desktop and I didn't put it on my iDrive, so it's not on this computer. So I don't know what my notes are. Okay. Clark? I think Michael's was waiting. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see. Michael? A couple of things. First of all, to uh, carry forward what you were saying about the relationships with the local bars and the attorneys. Um, it's interesting that when you're present at these trainings, it also gives us the opportunity to appreciate if there's any difficulty with the program, allows us to meet with program administrators, to talk to them, to help them out, um, and also with the local chair if he's struggling with getting arbitrators or she. Um, and, uh, and it allows us to answer questions right on the spot because this program isn't only just reading the script. But many times people have questions right there and we encourage them to ask people unique perhaps to their area. And we encourage them to participate as much as we can within the three hour program. Sometimes we have to speed it along and answer questions during the break or bring up that question after the break and say this was what was asked. And, and um, I think that's important. I think the strength of, of many of the programs exist because of, of the training sessions that we're doing. Our actual presence there makes a big difference. Additionally, uh, and I've been doing this training since 2002, I think I've been involved in over 100 throughout the state. Uh, what I find is that I, at times, become a mentor to program administrators, not program administrators, but to chairs of these programs, or to an attorney who might have a question, and because of the way their program is set up, they don't have the resources to ask that question. Sometimes they'll call the state bar, or sometimes they'll call the person who put on the program. And, and I think that's important in terms of the personal interaction. I've been involved in webcasts of this program uh, in Beverly Hills, I think we did the very first one um, where, where we had so much sign up that the local facility couldn't handle it. So they not only created a second room, but they broadcast it and they recorded it. But being in that situation, it, it minimized the ability to have interaction. Sure, we could come and we could learn, and that is certainly an important part of the process. Second of all, um, as I looked here uh, at the work of, under the heading of work of the mandatory fee arbitration committee that you have in your eye, um, there's a couple things that I think are important. Under the uh, section that deals with uh, the arbitration advisories, I think it, it really minimizes by just saying issues arbitration advisories to assist arbitrators. Anybody who's looked at the State Bar website to look at the list of arbitration advisories uh, there know the amount of work that goes into this. And it's not the type of work that any one staff member or one individual can do. It takes the collaboration 
of this entire committee. And these arbitration advisories aren't written, and then all of a sudden they come in and they're approved and they're done. But sometimes we go through three sessions before we get it down just right, the way everybody, everybody may not agree, but we agree that the final result is, is the best that there can be out there. So I would modify that to read that we research, prepare, and or revise advisories to assist arbitrators and to give and to provide attorneys and clients uh, information in the preparation for their arbitration or settlement. And I think, I think that it's a resource that's on the website, not only for attorneys, but for the public. And we are aware that the work of this particular committee on some of these arbitration advisories have resulted in the federal courts citing these arbitration advisories and adopting them as authority, thereby, thereby bringing um, the issues of attorney's fee disputes beyond a mere fee arbitration, so that it is, is more uniform, certainly across the state, to the extent that it can. can. And it's because of the hard work and research and collaboration that's performed by this committee. The second thing on here um, is about the training programs. And, and the training programs are not only for arbitrators. There are, there are people that show up that, that do not sign up for the arbitrators. So on that basis, I would say that they're also there providing information to attorneys to uh, improve their interaction with their own clients and to help minimize or eliminate the disputes that have arisen between the attorneys and clients as it relates to those relationships. You become a better attorney by attending these programs. You become a better practitioner. You know that your fee agreement has to be executed a certain way. And I know we all take the classes on um, early on, if we can harken back to the days when we got our initial bar license, we had to take, uh, we had to take an exam on the rules of professional responsibility. We had to pass that. But for some of us, how many years ago was that? And the types of activities this committee has undertaken, for example, writing the model, rule, writing the model rules to help all of the programs have um, uh, a consistent approach to fee arbitration throughout the state, to preparing uh, proposed draft agreements between the attorneys and clients so that they can better communicate and serve with their client about what their relationship is, to um, and the list, the list goes on about what this committee does, and it's always focused on making the attorney better at what they do in the business of practicing law and hopefully minimizing these issues that come up with, with their clients. It, it, it's really an important aspect of what this committee does. It's always focused on it's not focused on how are we going to get that attorney to get back the money or how are we going to chase away the, the client that, that's always complaining. It's about how to eliminate those issues by, by informing them about better practices, about informing them and reminding them about, for example, uh, Business and Professions Code 6148, where they have to have a signed written fee agreement with the client, and if the client wants a copy of their bills, they have to give it to them within 10 days or your fee agreement is void about the option of the client. Or, or 6147E that says if you can have a contingency fee agreement, you have to have a clause in there that says it's negotiable or your fee agreement is void about the option of the client. It tells you that, we tell them that they have to have a signed, the client has to receive an executed, a fully executed copy of the fee agreement at the time they enter into that agreement or if it's void about the option of the client. These are all practice tips, but where do we best communicate that with these attorneys? At these training centers and in our arbitration advisories. And, and that's the type of work that we do. And there's not a person on this committee or any of the committees that I've served on since 2002 that hasn't been dedicated. Nobody just comes and sits here and does anything. We're all trying to figure out how to get that information out there and how to make the attorneys in California better at what they do. So 
that, I guess I've spoken about as long as it seems. All right. So, helpful, thank you. So I'm going to go to Clark first and then back to Carol. Um, just one comment, and, and I'll keep it brief. I, I noticed that there was one uh, point under Division of Labor Process Improvements in the uh, stated that what more could be done by a committee or bar staff to strengthen and expand local bar MFA programs. And, and you recognize in, in your draft that about 95% of the arbitrations are handled are handled by local bars, and they're also handled uh, at a reimbursement by the state bar of $50 uh, per arbitration. Um, I, I think it might be useful, if you haven't done this already, to solicit inputs from the local bars as to what they view the deliverables of the state bar committee to be, and what they would like to see from the state bar with respect to supporting their local program. I, I know, for example, in, in my local county, in Santa Clara County, we do anywhere between 100 and 200 arbitrations a year, but I have heard continually from the local bar association that that uh, local fee arbitration program continues to lose money. Um, the reimbursement by the state bar is far too low, and, and we have a staff person who spends about uh, uh, probably half to two-thirds of her time um, maintaining the fee arbitration program as well as the other aspects of, of training and the like that the local bar provides. So, so I think you can get some valuable input from some of the local bars that might help focus the discussion at the state bar level as to what your deliverable would be to your your customers, essentially your clients, which would be the uh, which would be the local bars. And 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 I and again, I don't uh, profess to speak for every local bar program. I just know what's happening. In, in my county, but I think you might might get some very enlightening input if, if you were to go out and solicit that. And, and I'm certain the local administrators would be more than happy to share with you their clear points points of view on what what would help them. I think that that's a great suggestion. Yeah, I, I, th is there I, an email I list that we could? Are the easiest vehicle for collecting that type of information is through email surveys. Um, I don't know if there's yeah, there we keep a roster, yeah, that so be, that's yeah. Well, there's a program it. administrator. In, in every county, um, even if they're not full time, there's someone yeah. dedicated. Yeah. No, that's, a, and, that's a great suggestion. And then we find out, you know, what if, you know, let, let's go to the what if this committee was eliminated? What, how would you feel? You know, <laughs> if you're if you're out there running your program without assistance from the, the state bar and the 16 people that represent um, uh, the lion's share of lawyers that practice in this area throughout the state. One thing we do do in the training now is we have program administrator roundtables twice a year, one in Northern California and one in Southern California, where we have usually the chair, the presiding arbitrator, and sometimes the assistant presiding arbitrators, and we invite the program administrators and the program chairs. And it's a pretty open forum session. We, we hear what issues they have. We talk about various issues. So that's something we do now. Yeah, and I think um, when I was, when we were all explaining what we do, that was part of the list. So if it's not on the list, Richard, it should be on the list. So we have a lot of hands up. I think Carol was, was next. Yeah, um, two things I wanted to point out. Um, First of all, there is a big difference between what COCRAC writes and the arbitration advisories. COCRAC does not write opinions except in the area of ethics. They don't write things to instruct on what is the law, so to speak. Um, the advisories by this committee do that. So, um, you know, a casual user might think it's the same thing but it is two very distinct types of work product um, and for two very distinct purposes. Um, secondly, this committee does also work on the form fee agreements that are on the website and um, that is not something that <coughs> COCRAP does. It is, I think, a very, very valuable resource for people at a very practical level. If someone wants a fee agreement that they know it is vetted and thorough and approved by the state bar, that is a critical function. 
and we're just about to go through a process, I believe, I'm hoping, to update those to correspond to the new rules of professional conduct. So that is something that this committee, because of its um, sort of unique, uh, very super focused expertise on fees, which is one of a multitude of <coughs> ethics issues that COPRAC may touch upon. Um, this committee is uniquely really qualified to do that particular thing in a way that I think COPRAC has a much broader scope covering every ethics issue under the sun, not just fees. Fees are very, very um, important and a specific area of expertise that this committee can address. Joel. Thank you. Um, perhaps my only real useful function anymore is the class historian here. But I do want to focus in on the statutory <coughs> history of why we're all sitting here today. And in 1978, the uh, legislature passed uh, Article 13 of the State Bar Act, which required that there be mandatory fee arbitration. Uh, also in that statutory scheme in 6200D, it provides that local programs shall um, uh, provide pr um, MFA forum and that it also provides rules of procedure promulgated by local bar associations are subject to review by the board or a committee designated by the board to ensure that they provide a fair, impartial, and speedy hearing and award. In 1983, the board did establish such a committee. This one. This is established by legislature. Yeah, I provided um, a history to Richard. I don't know if it came into your draft report, but okay. I, I think it's important to, to, to list you know, where we came from. And then, then the final comment on this, I don't want to repeat what, what's been done, is that I've served on both COPRAC and <clears throat> this committee. Frankly, I prefer this committee because it's got a lot of fun people, but, um, and it does good work. <laughs> but anyway, um, we'll make sure there are, that. <laughs> when I said earlier that there are two different functions, um, I truly meant that, but then when you get down into who does this stuff? I know for a fact that when I was on COPRAC, there was no way that when we were considering these weighty uh, ethical topics of angels dancing on heads of pens and that sort of thing, we would ever get down into it and fulfill the statutory mandate. That's what this committee does and has done well, and I think should continue doing. Done. Yeah, and I. If I may, so I think in these sub-entities, with one exception, which is the Lawyer Assistance Program, where the actual committee is in the statute, the way they're all structured is the bar is required to have a program on fill-in-the-blanks, the arbitration, or et cetera, and it leaves to the bar to, to decide how to do that. But the bar. Uh, you're right, and Isabel shared with me those original documents, which I tried to summarize at the top of the second page. But about so for the first period, the board thought, "Oh, we'll see what this is about," and then they quickly determined, "Oh, we should have a committee," and and thus the committee was formed. But um, the legislation itself does not require any particular form of a committee, other than that the bar establish a way that, that the the mandate is carried out. And in most cases, what they've done is set up some sort of board, commission, committee, so forth to do it. Actually, I don't know if, if Jill said this, but um, I, I believe that the bar did it themselves. And the reason the committee was established was because they found it impossible to do themselves. Oh, exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, I know things are cyclical, and hopefully we're not on the we can do it <coughs> ourselves or we can eliminate us or Paris down to something that is just, you know, unworkable. Yeah, and just to respond, uh, we do have this 40-year <coughs> history with this program and a 30-some year history with this committee and its relationship to the program. And you're dealing with a process that because of this committee, in part, 
uh, has been successful, we know, in keeping 90% of, more than 90% of all the mandatory fee arbitration matters that come through it out of the courts. They don't go back. It's done its job. It's fulfilled its mandate. It's fulfilled the regulatory requirements. And to me, the smart thing would be, if I were sitting where you are, which I'm not, I would start with why take it away? Why change it? You're dealing with something that works. It's worked fantastically well, in part to the, the efforts of this and predecessor members of this committee who are dedicated to it. And <clears throat> to say that you're going to put it over to COPRA, which regularly uh, uh, is populated with well-intentioned and extremely bright attorneys, their focus is just different, absolutely different. I don't think that they could serve the dual purpose as well for either one of those purposes, just as we couldn't. I think this committee has fulfilled its obligations quite well and should be, uh, if it's going to be changed at all, it sh you should start with why. Yeah, and if it's not, it, in meeting with, with Richard, you know, I said, if, is, is it a cost, um, you know, are we costing them more too much? And, and the answer was no. So then why would you get rid of 16 lawyers and staff, two staff who, one's a lawyer, one's um, a law school graduate, um, with a minimum of 25 years in practice, some of us are legal malpractice specialists, that all we do is legal mail and fee disputes in our practice. Why would you get rid of or reduce that talent? It, it, and if it's not a cost issue, what what what's in it? What's in it for the bar other than shaking it up? You know. Well, and one other thing too is, is that I can recall over the past years or whatever a number of times, not many, but a number of times when this committee had an open disagreement with COPRA. And in some of the cases, the courts ultimately uh, ruled in favor of the way COPRA saw the world. Other times, they ruled against the way COPRA saw the world and ruled in favor of the way this committee saw the world because of its unique perspective. And to co combine them, you're gonna, you're gonna capture one function make it subordinary, subordinate to the other. And I think that that just is going to lessen the ability of either committee, either function to get performed well. I, there's so many people who want to speak. I don't, I, I want to make sure that we get everybody's uh, like voices heard and out there. I'm, I'm not trying to cut. I, I would like to respond to what you said, but I want to make sure that we get everybody. Yeah, I want to hear from Ani yeah. and then I think, did Nick have your hand up? And, okay, so Anahe, Nick, um, George, Ken. So my question is, do we know what COPRAC's feeling is on this, that it can handle it, it can't handle it? Because honestly, I, I, I don't have one opinion or the other. I think it's a, this committee is certainly doing its job and it's doing it well, and I think it's necessary, but do we know how COPRAC feels about having it, the this committee or parts of the authority or the obligations of this committee being utilized by it or being performed by it. Well, well, I, I, I don't <laughs> think I don't think that, but I, I think that it, it may not be the right question because the the question isn't so much what Coprac thinks about it. The question is what the board of trustees thinks about it. Right, but but the, the thing is, we are be, we've been talking about what we believe will happen in the event that this committee's functions are being uh, performed by COPRAC. And we do not believe, for reasons that Joel articulated, and I hadn't really thought about that until Joel articulated it, but it makes sense to me, you know, they are, they, they, that committee does something very different from our committee. And the mindset of the people engaged in that committee is very different from the mindset of people engaged in this committee. And so, um, is that something that can be hybridized? Is that something that 
uh, someone who is a serial and not really, because while I do think COPRAC does good work, um, I also think 95% of the attorneys who practice probably even more than that are not at those lofty heights. You know, we know about the rules, but you know, I'm sure across the board it's like, you know, I don't stop at the stop limit line all the time. I go a little further out. Um, and so can, can that be meshed? Um, and it may not be. And so that's why I ask what they think. I understand that it's not our choice. I understand it's not Coprax's choice as to what happens, but is it not important to know if Coprac can do this work? Is it not important to know if the, this committee doesn't believe that the ends of what is required is going to be accomplished through hybridizing the committee? I think it is important. So I think it is the right question. Well, if I could point one thing. Yeah, we're sort of, you know. I, no, I but like just to answer her question, okay. I'll stick to that. Anecdotally, I have talked to, over the years, a number of COPRAC members, uh, and generally, uh, to the extent they express an opinion, it's often that this committee is too hard on lawyers. There you are. So, but the, yeah, the, so the suggestion that this committee would be somehow absorbed by COPRAC and that COPRAC would remain unchanged, both in terms of its cultural approach, its, its legalistic interpretation, even its personnel, I think is, is also what I'm, I'm saying is perhaps not what we would be looking at. I, don't, I think that if there were a, a merger of functions, that would also involve a, a transformation of what the charge is and the, the change of personnel in terms of who would be doing that work. It wouldn't be, oh, the exact same people who are currently on pro COPRAC who don't have experience in mandatory fee arbitration would then be dealing with mandatory fee arbitration. It would be a matter of finding the right personnel and making sure that the, the roles are aligned properly. But this is, I'm, I'm a little concerned that we're getting too much into the, the weeds of, of a specific possibility rather than sort of stepping back to the big picture of why the review is being undertaken generally, which was a, an issue that Lorraine raised. But, but I don't want, again, I don't, I, there's, this is great that we're getting all this input and I want to just make sure that we continue to get this feedback. So I think, um, did you have a comment, Nick, and then George? Yes, on um, just a very general level. Again, I'm, personally, I, I'm somewhat um, confused as to whether the charge is, like uh, Lorraine said, uh, financial, or whether it's uh, a client protection. If it's public protection, one of the things that maybe wasn't specifically stated, yes, there are some very old attorneys in this room. Oh, it's seasoned. <laughs> old. I feel very old. Well. But the reality is, is that in this room, we've arbitrated, as arbitrators, literally thousands of cases. Yeah, I provided a list of everybody on the right. committee. I, I put in their experience. I put how many arbitrations I thought we handle. Right. But so that, that's been given to them. Right. But I, I think that needs to be specifically stated like you did. And also, in this room, <laughs> there are people that run local programs. So we bring an intellectual discourse to this committee that cannot be matched anywhere. Whether that function is transferred to a staff person or to COPRAC. The reality is that Isabel, uh, uh, our, our contact here at the State Bar, is more than intellectually capable to sit down and write an advisory regarding any of the topics that we've dealt with as a committee. But the reality is, is that like on reasonable fees, that arbitration advisory took two and a half years, not to write, but to revise. And not only, it's not because we were intellectually lacking, but rather it had to incorporate all of the different visions of everybody at this table and our members that are, have been gone. As well as, once it went up to the Board of Trustees, the Board of Trustees came down and said, well, hang on a second, we need to have our input. Now, I'm sure that had that function been dealt with by Isabel or by someone on COPRAC, it would have been completed, but it would not have had the complexity and the consideration that our final product 
um, uh, included. Because we put in real life real experience. experience. And you don't get that um, if you have a hypothetical case um, that may have come through the, the, the hotline. So, George? Uh, back to uh, Clark's point about support for uh, local fee arbitration programs. And I, I'm, my association was with San Mateo County before joining this uh, committee. And uh, San Mateo County has a, a much smaller population and smaller programs. So as opposed to the low hundreds, we're in more than dozens. Um, uh, but it's uh, even in a small county, it's nice to have support. I have this information because I have another agenda item. But it's, it's relevant here, back to his point about numbers. San Mateo County is uh, currently losing $70,000 a year, or spending, to, to, to move forward with this program. Um, and I think the, the, um, uh, the board of the, the local bar association sees it as a valuable program and, and is willing to make a commitment and would like to get the 70000 down a little bit. But, but even re regardless of whatever, if there's any uh, approval that we're going to, the San Mateo County Bar is going to be able to charge higher fees, it's still going to be losing money. It's still probably going to be losing about $40,000 a year. So, so the support is important. All right. Right. Yeah, just very briefly, uh, I guess it's primarily in support of what Nick said. I've got over 20 years' experience as an arbitrator. I'm either the newest or the second newest member of this committee. But I, I would emphasize that as an arbitrator over the years, the advisories that have come from this committee have been absolutely invaluable in fairly deciding the issues that came before me, both as a single arbitrator and as chairman of a panel. And without those advisories, the job of the volunteer arbitrator would be horribly more difficult. Ken. I wanted to address the uh, issue about the presiding arbitrator and the assistant presiding arbitrator remaining as volunteers or becoming staff functions. I, I'm the current presiding arbitrator, so that's why I want to address that. Uh, Joel was my immediate predecessor. And I guess it's similar to some of the uh, comments you've had. I'm not sure why you would want to bring that in-house as a staff function as opposed to a volunteer. Because in, you know, in, in my case, I've got less experience than Joel. Joel had less experience than his predecessor. But you've got attorneys with 30 to 40 years of litigation experience uh, volunteering their time to uh, handle these presiding arbitrator matters, which include appearing in state bar court to litigate uh, involuntary enrollment motions, and then issuing orders on a variety of procedural and jurisdictional issues. Um, you know, having that level of experience um, for free, I'm not sure where the bar would benefit by taking it in-house and paying someone to do that. Uh, and you know, you talk about having it as a staff function, um, I have the greatest admiration for Isabel and staff. I've worked with the staff for years and years, but they have not been out as arbitrators. Uh, they said, my history, I've been arbitrating cases for 20 years. I've been a former chair of this uh, committee. I've been the presiding arbitrator for a few years now. So I bring all of that with me to handle these types of issues and if necessary, litigate them in the state bar court at no cost to the bar, other than my travel expenses, uh, which thankfully I don't have to go down to court very often to do that. So I, I guess I, I would like to see it stay with volunteers from the committee because you just, I don't know how you could duplicate that level of experience and expertise uh, without spending a whole lot more money if you had to hire an attorney with even a fraction of that level of expertise to try and do this in-house. Now we have merged to some extent you know, with Isabel being an attorney 
She is now also performing some of the presiding arbitrator functions with me and it helps that she can sign motions now so we can you know, expedite that process. So that, that, I, that, that does work and I think that is helpful to have someone in-house, a staff attorney, who can help with some of these functions. It does make speed things up. Um, but you know, in terms of you know, you know, ultimately issuing the orders and litigating the cases in court, um, I see a lot of value to having the volunteers do this. And I can tell you, I mean, I've spent hundreds of hours uh, just in my role as presiding arbitrator, uh, you know, as a pure volunteer and. I can't imagine what the cost would be to the state bar if you were paying somebody in-house to do what I do as a volunteer or what Joel did or his predecessors. And along those lines, you can, um, you know, hire uh, or assign these tasks to, you know, general counsel, but, you know, Ken's been a lawyer for 30, 36 years, I've been a lawyer for 36 years. Over time, your memory bank of situations that you've seen is, is tremendous. And to contrast that with an entry level lawyer or maybe a mid-entry general counsel, that person isn't going to have that experience that allows us to pick up a file and to instantly know and spot issues, you know, reach the right conclusion and issue the right order. You just don't get that with, you know, someone come out of law school even 10, 15 years. Um, so, you know, the bar can make its choice that the APAs and the PA is going to be a general counsel, but I think you're going to lose, um, you know, number one, volunteer hours, and number two, tremendous experience. Joe. Yeah, um, a couple of things. I, well, I think it was 2013. Ken, you were part of that, where we um, worked on revising the rules of procedure. Yeah, uh, we for the whole thing, seconds. and Ken and I and Doug Hull, and we had numerous conference calls, and we revised all the rules, and they were adopted without change of a comma by the Board of Trustees. I mean, the Board of Trustees, COPRAC, none of these people are going to put in or have the time to put in that kind of effort and detail that we did, which saved them any work at all. Um, the second thing is, is that one of the difficulties we've had over the years is outreach to the courts to let them know that we exist and to let them know when they're required, not only is it advisable, to, to send it to mandatory fee arbitration. And I think if you do anything to diminish the um, independent operation of this committee, you're going to give up, you're going to further hurt our efforts to, to reach out to the courts to let them know that we're here and that we're providing this function successfully. So has everybody that wanted to make a comment made a comment? Okay. Any feedback from uh, Doug or Richard? Well, so briefly, just, just to make sure there's not a misunderstanding. The question is really not whether your expertise is valued or whether you've done good things because you obviously have and that's recognized. The question the board's trying to ask of every single sub entity is what is the best way to capture that expertise and apply it to the work at hand? So sometimes that's a working group that comes together, does something like in, in a, every five years we need to revise something basis, and then they're thanked and resume their normal lives. Uh, sometimes it's a task force, sometimes. So the, the bar has proliferated a number of standing committees far greater than any other regulatory entity in California, way, way more extensive. And the question is, how did we get here? Is that the best way to do all of this work? Uh, are we right-sized for all of this stuff? Because you can see that if you're a 15-member board trying to administer 254 volunteers and make sure that the 10 sub-entities are working in alignment with the strategic plan and the bar is moving in a direction, that that's a reasonable question to ask. And so that's what these questions are, is just if we step way back and just start asking questions, let's see what we come up with. So there's no, I don't want anybody here to go away thinking that the board or, or the, what I'm doing with or the team is, 
is dismissive of the work or, or the expertise, the knowledge. Every single regulatory entity at the state and federal level does exactly that thing, trying to tap, use uh, experts of, in, with their real world experience to improve what the work they're doing. And it, this transformation into a regulatory entity, the board simply asking, how is there are there different ways we could do this? Because they can see across them there are certain functions like education, where the content of that comes from experts, but the delivery, uh, the, you know, one of the, the delivery might need to do all the skills and knowledge of professional adult educators to help make it very effective. So you you've articulated very well the reasons why the in person uh, preference exists. So. We will certainly reflect those. And um, you know, a lot of this stuff, I think the other big challenge is to make sure that everybody knows what all these sub-entities are doing and how they do it. So that's job one is to describe it correctly. And job two is to try to maybe reframe or focus the questions to ask them in a way that makes sense. Um, do, you, do you feel like we've adequately responded to your questions, or is there an area that you would like us to focus on before we leave? I, I think there's been a great discussion and I appreciate all of the frank input. And ultimately, it's going to be the Board of Trustees who, um, who will take the information and consider it within a, a, an analytic framework that addresses some of the questions that Richard was just raising, which, is, which was the charge of the governance and the public interest task force. It's, it's not a mundane exercise in budget cutting. It's really about governance of a regulatory body. And in terms of governance of a regulatory body, I think what, what this conversation reflects and what I've, I've certainly seen in other discussions with Board of Legal Specialization, the Lawyer Assistance Program Oversight Committee, the other groups, is that it, the people are, are very dedicated to their work, but will sometimes not view the organizational managerial challenge of the fact that there are over 200 volunteers who serve on somewhere around 10 of these committees, which as a management issue for the Board of Trustees and for the state bar leadership is, is a challenge. That, that, that simple fact creates a challenge. And Can you it, describe that more? Because I, 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 I'm hearing your words, but on a practical Latin level, how is that a challenge? Is it, is it um, a view that because we're not employees, we don't, there's no control over what we do, how we do it, what we say, um, how it's said? Can you describe that in more practical well, the, terms? There are different examples. Because I'm so, not an employee of the bar, so you can't you know, terminate me. And I guess you could kick me off the committee. But I, I'm just trying to figure out what is the management. Um, well, without, without pointing fingers or naming names, I mean, in general, so the kinds of issues that have arisen in, in the, looking at some of these are some of the sub-entities believe that they, they control the budget and that the staff person, in this case, let's say, Isabel, works for them, not for the bar. So that's kind of a confusion that needs to be set straight because that doesn't lead to necessarily the right outcomes for things. There are some yeah. committees and commissions and boards that have made, that have Thought and I and without bad you know no bad intentions here. Everybody's trying to do the right thing. I have filed amicus briefs without the board knowing about it. Have taken positions advocating no legislation without the board even knowing about it. So when the board goes to Sacramento to say, "Hey, here's our position on this," they say, "Well, that's not what we heard from." Mm -hmm. And then it, it's so it makes it impossible. Yeah, and, for and the bar applying to, as applied to us, we don't treat we treat Isabel and. and or, you know, Doug before, you know, they're the state bar employees. We never got involved in budget. In fact, we do everything to share cabs, to minimize expenses. We're really on, on that. And then to answer your second question, we always, if we had an issue, went to the Board of Trustees and got on their agenda to get permission to, to do something that we knew would reflect on, on the bar, and and at the bar, it was the bar's voice. So, so, I'm so to say, it's not everyone matter. has done that. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. That's the government's issue. Yeah. But, but yeah. the one thing I would add, if, if you don't mind, Ken, because I thought you wanted to speak, but the one thing I would add is also that there is, and this is a hugely mundane issue, but it's one that I'm currently dealing with a, another committee that is not actually a sub entity, but that is a committee 
that the bar um, vets candidates for and has to continue to staff. Um, and so I saw that in the write-up that Richard had that, that part of your work is naming the members of the committee, the future members of the committee, so appointing of the committee members for the continuing work that you do in the future. But there are elements of that that is also a bar function in terms of like making sure that the Board of Trustees is, um, is actually reviewing and overseeing the selection process and that it's, uh, in, it's comfortable that it has the people that it needs, that it's, the work that's involved in that should not be minimized when it extends out to, again, over 200 volunteers who serve. The, the board of, think about the Board of Trustees on an annual basis. Some of, these, some of these positions are more than annual, and they serve for more than a single year. But again, think about on an annual basis the, the capacity of the Board of Trustees to receive appointment information on volunteers and to think about them clearly about like, okay, well, are these the right people for the work that we need to do? So, yeah. And we followed the procedure that was given to us, which was, you know, it comes from us and then it goes to the Board of Trustees. So whatever you know, procedure you want to put in place. I was chairman yeah. last year. Mm -hmm. and my recollection of the appointment policy is that we, he, along with the chair and the public member, he proposes it's a nomination process that is ultimately uh, authorized by the board. So he doesn't have the capacity to appoint anybody to, the, to this committee. But the board doesn't have the capacity to truly exercise an oversight role when it's dealing with the volume of, of nominations that it deals with. I, mean, but I think that this is just a question of could, us. Could it realistically? I mean, could, you, could, could the board have the time to vet you know, 150, 200 potential I, I don't think so. I mean, right. I think that that's part. So, so this is the this is part of the problem. We, how do you delegate it? How do you how do you do that work? How do you ensure that that work is aligned with the with the strategic plan of the board of trustees and with any given initiative of the board of trustees? Well, you, by by saying what you said, you you've really made the case for why this committee fits the mold that you're looking for because it's not 16 volunteers or 16 members of this committee, it's thousands of arbitrators that are required uh, by the legislature to be involved with local programs. And if you take away this committee, somebody's going to have to now vet thousands of arbitrators without some guidance working its way up to the state bar and board of trustees in deciding who sits on this committee. And that said, I'd really like to find out what we need to do to get you to, to be advocates for us, for the trustees. We're not trying to fight the board. I mean, we understand what the board does and what its responsibilities are. And I've testified or spoken before the board or one of these uh, reorganization committees, I would guess about a dozen times over the years. I fully appreciate the challenge they've got. But now how can we become, enlist you to help us be advocates to convince them that we're doing exactly what needs to be done? And that attempts to change it, find new personnel other than the normal process, um, might just hurt a very valuable program mandated by the legislature. Please give some thought to that. Isabel? Um, I just want to speak briefly about the appointments process um, that Dad had kind of mentioned. So every year we have new arbitrators. We uh, have the presenting arbitrator who is renewed. And then last year in 2017 for the November RAD agenda item um, and new staff RAD, uh, we had 464 volunteer arbitrators who were up for renewal. So uh, we do have safeguards for that. We run um, checks through OCTC to see if they have any reportable actions. Um, and then we, we, we vet all of our arbitrators. So they're at the staff level and at the PA level. The PA does some you know, vetting of our new arbitrators as well. And our volunteer arbitrators are our, our lifeline. So I mean, we do a lot of the vetting for that. And so that's almost 500 people just for this program, not even um, committee the state staff. Bar program, not the, the state bar fee arbitrator, right. That's our pool. We have about 460 right now. And um, as for the committee, um, the committee appointments, 
the subcommittee, we vet them. We have their applications. The board gets the same dossier on, on our applicants. Um, as part of the appointments agenda items, we do a brief summary of each applicant's uh, expertise, uh, why their experience would be valuable to the committee, uh, what district they represent. We have our own uh, appointments policy, which we just updated in April as well as the board of appointments policy that we use. So there are guidelines in which we operate. So it's not willy-nilly, um, and it is a process that we go through. So I don't think that should be that much of a uh, concern. And, uh, and of course, we have to get the board's approval. So I think there are safeguards built into the appointments process. And you know, volunteers really are the lifeblood of this committee and program. So to respond to, to, to the question, what, what can you do? The thing you can do is what you're doing now, which is to, <laughs> to give us this information. But um, I will revise this. And I do want to say that Isabel has been amazing in not just providing the initial round of stuff, but in answering my many, many questions. Because as I said to her, I need to get this. It's obvious to me that not everybody understands how these different sub entities work. There's folkloric knowledge. There's well, in Arizona, they know somebody in Arizona, so they think, well, why aren't we like Arizona? And there's very specific reasons why we may or may not be like Arizona across these sub-entities. So um, if you have additional comments, sending them in, and we can reflect those. But there will be, you have more. <laughs> the best thing we can do is to try to reflect what your concerns and why you, what, what your view is of these questions that they've been framed. Um, so that there's the best possible context for thinking about them. Uh, and frankly, I think when the board gazes across this large universe of sub-entities, it may decide that different ones will be on different paths. We need more time on this one. This one, everyone's clear and there's consensus on, so let's start moving forward on improving how we're going to work together. So it's not necessarily that you know on September, whatever the day of the meeting is, you know, the um, gavel will fall and all will be decided about all the entities and so I mean, misunderstanding about the process. I think this is a work in progress and, and very specifically the idea is to ensure that along the way all of the different sub-entities and their dedicated volunteers have had the opportunity to make their voices heard in the process. That's only going to help uh, the board make it to the they can hang additional yeah, comments. One other thing I did want to address, the concept of the ad hoc working groups. Because I, I don't think that's practical in terms of what this committee does. Did we talk in there about reviewing model program guidelines? That's one thing we do do, but we also, anytime a uh, county bar program wants to change its rules in any way or change its fees, that requires board approval. That comes to the committee where we vet it. Sometimes, you know, in, in terms of either a fee increase or a particular rule, the local bar program, you know, it's almost on an emergency basis. That sometimes they need to have a rule change fixed. They need to have a fee change. They need to have this. And, you know, those come up at our meetings, which happen, happen you know, on a regular basis so we can address the issue that the local bar program has, run it up the ladder to the board, and then deal with whatever problem that local bar program might be having. So having you know, an ad hoc uh, working group that meets you know, a couple years or once in a year to kind of review some general stuff uh, just wouldn't, in my view, wouldn't really function with a lot of the, these types of things that this committee deals with in terms of the rules and or issues that local bar programs uh, face and, and need some help from the state bar and like the rules. We do the vetting and we prepare it with the other group programs to make sure there's uniformity throughout the state in terms of how, you know, the fee structures, so, you know, programs aren't getting out of line one way or the other. And then we make our recommendation and that goes up to the board and they either approve it or don't approve it. So it's, it's, it's I, the ad hoc working group thing. I can see certain situations where that might work, but for many of the functions we do, particularly with respect to the rules and fees, I don't think that's feasible because, you know, you know, local programs sometimes need to be dealt with right away. 
question, one last comment before we move on um, the agenda. Um, I, I appreciate, Richard, that you know some um, determinations will be uh, sort of rolling, um, but our, our concern from the committee is um, we're on three-year appointments, um, so our work will be significantly affected if we don't have a decision about, you know, we have people in the pipeline that um, are, are going rolling off and uh, we have applicants. And so from our perspective, we need a decision from the Board of Trustees so we can continue um, our work. Because if we're in limbo, then, you know, we don't know who's going to be on the committee, who's going to be the chair, you know, who's going to be the PA. It just puts us into um, a, a very untenable position. So, you know, um, if we're on the top of the list for a decision, you know, we, we'd be happy about that. All right. Um, if there's no further comments, um, thank you, Richard and Deb, for coming to the meeting. And I guess the next part of the process is uh, another draft report. Or um, yes. Okay, great. Thanks so much. I think that's Thank it. Thank you. Meanwhile, we have additional comments. For behind you, 1,000%. Is it valid for me? Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, like I said before, I'm going to jump around the agenda a little bit. Um, a, a, a fairly easy item uh, is I. Um, Nick attended the um, Supreme Court oral argument. Anything to add to your report, Nick? Uh, no. It, well, uh, basically, the, the, the issue is, um, can the violation of uh, Rules of the 3310 uh, obviate uh, responsibility for a client to have to pay uh, their attorney's fees? So. Uh, Could you read from the tea leaves? Sometimes when I've appeared at oral argument. It's, it's a very interesting Which way the court would go? Uh, you, by the questions, they were extremely concerned about the viability of um, the uh, Shepherd Mullins position. Well, they they were they went on a waiver. Well, they, they had a blind waiver. Right. It's a blind past waiver. Right. Uh, and it addressed the framework agreement that they had. You know, but the, the problem becomes this: what happens when that um, uh, existing client becomes a client again, an active client? who's adverse to another client in the same firm. I got the, the sense... The blanket waiver isn't going to work. Well, that's not, that's not what Shepard Mullen is arguing. Huh. Shepard Mullen saying that there are instances where that would continue to work. Hmm. Assume that the, the, uh, the adverse client uh, has a confidential uh, representation that they can't disclose under 3310 and get another waiver on. They say, we expect someone as sophisticated as this other client to know that. Hmm. But um, the, the long and short of it is, um, uh, it, it's interesting how it's going to work out. There was a uh, request sent out by the Supreme Court before oral arguments to try to have the um, parties designate the date that um, the uh, Water District became an actual client again, where they were actively uh, a participant in the actual in the key time action. And I guess maybe what they're doing there is saying after that time, you should have disclosed, should have gotten the, or, or withdrawn or gotten a waiver. And having not done so, then you're not entitled for uh, fees. But before that time, you may be entitled to some quantum Merowit type of, uh, of recovery. So they have 90 days to rule? Um, really? No, it's, uh, Supreme Court can, can extend that. I thought to, all, all decisions. Well, we'll see. Yeah. Stay tuned. Yeah, I, I, I know that they can extend it ad infinitum. Yeah. yeah. One, one other comment I would make on that is that in the new Rule 1.7, the Supreme Court released um, that will become effective on November 1, they do have a comment that approves the use of an advanced waiver of conflicts of interest based on a factors test. So um, if that is any indication of which way the Supreme Court's thinking is leaning, um, they did include that comment in the new conflict of interest rule that, that will become effective. 
All right, um, let's turn to um, business uh, agenda item A, finalize the new advanced fee arbitration training outline. Um, this has been on our agenda for three times. I think we've worked it to it fairly well. Um, is there a motion to approve the outline for the corrections? Totally. Right. Uh, on page 10. Well, there, there I'll goes. just, uh, before you get started, we've, we've gone through this, so now we're correcting corrections and corrections. Well, and this, this is, uh, in paragraphs four and five, one place we're changing the word section to the section symbol in the next paragraph, and five, we're using the word section. In today's materials, there are over 50 instances of one or the other, okay. and what I'm proposing is let's pick one, and then I'll give uh, Isabel a list of all the places that it's involved, and, and they can all, all be corrected. Okay, so what is everybody's preference? Um, the section symbol or the word section? Section symbol, raise your hand. Well, I have to take the vote. So, okay, so we're doing section, section symbol. Section symbol. So, Lorraine, section symbol. Nick, eight. Yeah, eight. All right. All right. So, search and replace. Yeah. I will second the this. word. All right. So, we're going we're to go with the section symbol instead? Okay, that's fine. I can do search and replace. Roy, you don't need to do this. All right, so is there a motion to approve the um, advanced training outline with, so moved. with the uh, section Second. symbol? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So we're actually going to be using this in San Diego um, uh, the day before our meeting. So we'll be getting uh, feedback from San Diego, which is a fairly sophisticated bar. And I'm looking forward to presenting it. So um, I would like to plagiarize this and use it for advanced fee arbitration mm -hmm. training locally in Santa Clara County. Sure. And I'm going to. Um, mean, um, not that Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to put together um, a, a PowerPoint. Um, so hopefully that will you know, be used um, when I'm off the board in future trainings. So to go along with. The uh, outline or um, the agenda item D, the award forms, and there's a couple other forms that um, I guess we put together. Do you want to handle that? Yeah, that's page uh, 43. Uh, 43, yeah. Uh, it's kind of in a little bit of a long order. I mean, we have starting on page 56, that's in seven, is the sample award that now should be, uh, it should incorporate all the changes that we all agreed to the last um, the question that Isabel and I had is because what we wanted to do was we had the sample award, which is like obviously the end product, but we wanted to be able to also show the documents that might come up um, as the case makes its way to um, the arbitrator. So, what does the request for arbitration of fees be look like? The notice of clients, well, the notice of clients rights, the request, the um, attorney's reply, appointment of the arbitrator, um, some of the documents that proceed um, starting at page 48. The question is, in all of these documents, the client or the client is referred to as the client, and the attorney is referred to as the attorney. And in our award, we talk about a petitioner and a respondent. And that's not how the state bar forms currently refer to those parties. So it's a little bit of an inconsistency um, that 
we're trying to figure out should we correct it or yeah. and and if we are going to correct it which way are we correcting it you know? so the one issue i would see there is while 99 percent of the time if not higher the petitioner is the client sometimes it's a lawyer right so you know it's kind of have to have some kind of designation, you know, petitioner responded and you can talk about it in the war, you know, discussion, petitioners, you know, client or whatever, but you do occasionally get the lawyer who makes the request or a third party uh, payor. So the attorney is always the attorney, the, <laughs> the client is always the client, so why don't we use those terms? Yeah, as long as I can use That's what I use in my petitioner. Or Respondent, I always have attorney and client, and it also clarifies for the non-lawyer who they're talking about. Give me a word, and I also recently saw some confusion by arbitrators in the way they were using it, and they were getting mixed up awards. So I think make it consistent with this document. It just clarifies everything for everybody. She disagrees. Yeah, I think no. it should be petitioner respondent because you don't always have the client. Uh, uh, who is the client, um, it, and it just, it, it makes more sense because it's very clear, you can identify at the beginning the name of the person, and throughout, then you know that that person is referred to as, bless you, uh, petitioner or respondent, and um, again, it's a preference, obviously, because I have always used petitioner and respondent, I've never, because uh, sometimes we get also disputes between attorneys, and they they do do through the voluntary program. That's true, but the same system can be used for that. And so I think it just makes more sense uh, to have petitioner or respondent, and you know, and you know the peti you know what's going to happen, and you identify them. There should be no confusion whatsoever. Kill. I just took a quick look at the statute which governs our activities and nowhere do I see petitioner or respondent. I see attorney and client. So that to me is an important consideration. Secondly, I haven't looked at a request for a notice of client's request for fee arbitration, notice of client's right to fee arbitration or a request for fee arbitration to the local program, but mostly those refer to as client and attorney, not petitioner. Yeah, and we do have one in the packet. It's the state bar form, and it does say client, and then person who paid attorneys. Wait, right. Okay, and then attorney, and, that, and then they say person who paid attorneys fees. Right. Which is that the third brings me, That brings me to the wager case, which is the one that made us have to consider um, uh, petition or petitions, <laughs> requests filed by third party payors, and in that case, if memory serves. Um, it says that for the purposes of such a mandatory fee arbitration, that third party pay or is the quote client. It doesn't say a petitioner or anything else. So I, I, I'm, I think we ought to go with attorney and client because it, you know. Well, the reason that the wager says that is because a client is required to be given notice of client's right to arbitrate. And so that's why the court said that for purposes of the statute, a payor, a third party payor, is a client. That doesn't necessarily mean that in the form itself it has to be designated as client. I, I, I can see that it, it makes it, it's easier, um, but I, I don't think that that's why the court called it client. Uh, they called it client because that person also needs notice of client's right to arbitrate. I move that we use client and attorney. All right, is there a second? Second. Second. All right, uh, this is one that we're going to vote on. So all in favor of using client and attorney in the um, form that we're going to ask people to use, say, uh, raise your hand. All right, is that so everybody? Except for so you <laughs> need to modify the introductory language. I'm resisting. To address <laughs> <laughs> Resisting. I just said. About RBG. That person being identified so as the tribe because they're a I don't know what you're doing. We're, we're on page 43, aren't we? 
Because Isabel had a question. Okay, so my question is, is this for the purpose of the training materials only? So I'll retain the same bar form. Right, because the so same you're not changing anything that you did. Okay. And you think your forms should just stay as they are? I mean, okay. I mean, the state bar doesn't have forms that are going to like uh, cover all of these various. No, it's it's a form that's subject because, to modification. Because the way I, that the yeah, form. Yeah, is, no, I just want to clarify because the state bar forms already refer to the parties as attorney and client. Right. And the only issue that we had was should we change the state bar forms to reflect the petitioner responded. So, so we're not doing that. Right, I'm so we're not doing that. To, okay, so that, to that's easy to change because I think it's only on two forms. Because on one form, I actually change it to potential respondent. So that's an easy fix. Yeah. You okay. and I'll just we'll yeah. The sample okay. award is easily changed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I just yeah. want to make sure what we were changing. Yeah. So we'll like conform. Them. You might might I add suggested language in there that the, the client is finds the client because they're a third party. But that's not what the sample award talks about. Okay. They, that's not the. That's yeah, not the we, we've gone through the sample so award not, again like five or six times. Case. I think this is the last change. Yeah. And, and okay. then if you all want to tweak it later on. I mean, that can be that can be discussed as part of the training program. Yeah. No tweaking. All right. Okay. So um, we have the. Um, Award form finalized with the change of attorney and client. Looks like we have one question over here with Roy. Roy? Yeah, I, I've got two other minor things, but okay. on page 44, and the fees incurred in amount of dispute, if there's a written fee agreement, what fees were charged? There's no provision for indicating what fees were charged without a written fee agreement. And there, there can be occasions where that occurs. And Roy, the purpose of this form isn't that it's set in stone. It, it's it's a template that oh, is I, subject to change with with minimum requirements. Well, I, so well, so I, I'd like to include the world in a form, but we just can't. Okay. My my other comment is, is to me is more important, and that is the uh, waived fees. I think there should be a. a specific provision that if these were waived, somebody has to pay them to the uh, agency or that the waiver stay. In other words, the, the client's fees were waived. We're now awarding against the client, uh, I mean against the attorney. Shouldn't the attorney be required to pay the fees directly to the uh, local bar or the state bar as the case may be? I am not following you at all. Okay. Uh, Are you referring to um, uh, page forty six? Page forty six. Yeah. Right. Allocation of filing fees. Yeah. Oh, all so right. If, if the filing fees are allocated to the attorney, but the fee, the actual fees were waived, shouldn't there be a provision that the, those allocated fees now must be paid by the attorney direct to the, the agency? So you want to include like an um, alternate paragraph for yes. that possibility? Yes, that, that, uh, it would always be the attorney, it would never be the client. That we want to put that into a default form because in my opinion that's sort of an unusual situation. I think you, don't, you can leave this form the way it is because it doesn't, it just says the filing fee shall be paid to... Right, it just says 12 and 19. I mean, if somebody's going to have a question on that specific fact pattern, I'm sure they'll ask you're, you're gonna, you're gonna modify and, and it, it. It varies by county. Not all county programs do that. So I don't yeah. think we want to put that in the. Uh, uh, Not to yeah. mention. This is like the basics that, that anybody can pick it up. And if you do have, I think, a very sophisticated issue, hopefully that arbitrator panel will know that they can <laughs> add that to the form. Well, the other question, ultimately, for the. the I, I saw this in Red County, so you get the word. That the attorney is supposed to pay the filing fee of seven thousand dollars, six thousand, five thousand. That it was waived for the client, and, and then it's not being paid to the client. So who enforces that award? In Marin County, the administrator at that time just went and filed a small claims action against the people, the attorney, even though it wasn't authorized. But you know, that's the smart attorney is just going to say nobody can enforce that anyway. That is the state bar. Yeah. All right, so we have a approved form. I appreciate your comments, Roy. Um, but I think this is just 
sort of the, the basics and it can be modified. All right. Um, So, I, I've got the way. Okay, I'm going to combine G and K. Did they proof, Ken? G and K is San Mateo, or San Mateo um, changing the filing fee, and then we had an add-on for uh, proposed mediation rules. So I know George was working on the fee part of it. And my suggestion is that we continue it to September, combine those two, and um, if George feels comfortable working with review of the mediation proposed rules. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is that so? San Mateo is okay to wait until then, since that's you guys. <coughs> I just want to be sure. So it just operate under the existing fee schedule. Right. The existing fee schedule is then. Yeah, so I just yeah. think it'd be it'd be you know more of a, a, a process to approve one and not the other. We just say we we look at you know all issues that you submitted to us and get you a decision after the, the September meeting. Or you can approve the fees and take the. Well, George has got to tell us. I don't know if, well, it, I, yeah, if, I, if it's a big deal. I, I think it, it. I think it's a big deal because until uh, Alma went back to the. Uh, uh, San Mateo Bar Association got more involved with the, the numbers. Um, uh, nobody had paid any attention to it there, and she got back and started paying attention to it, and and they've been uh, losing money for years. Um, but but will the time frame between now and September make it make a difference? And and, and you know I'll defer. I don't know if Isabel has more information on that, but. Um, my take on, they're not changing it. We, we had comments last time that we wanted sort of a structured fee and it just came back the same. So I think we need to have a dialogue with incorporating our comments. Because our comments at the last meeting were that we, it should be a, 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 like a tiered structure. And all that came back in our materials this time was the same, the same structure, which was a tiered. So, so I don't know if you've had an actual dialogue with Alma or the program chair uh, on this issue, but it hasn't changed between last meeting. Well, there is a tiered structure. Well, it's not. It hadn't changed from the last meeting. What's the, uh... Can can comment in on it? You know, it's reflected in our minutes. What's the, what's the board? Do you have to, well, there's the annual meeting, but I don't know if they consider um, these type of business items. And then after that, it would be November. So if we approve them today or we approve them in September, it's, it's not probably going to go on November. The board approval would be at the right. same time. Yeah, because yeah. 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 November we have to do the uh, Appointments as well as all the arbitrary appointments and the That's right. What other days? There's any chance it would get approved earlier? At the it would have to be November. November. Yeah. The board meeting. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let's put it on the next. Uh, but but I you know my comment is, um, in last meeting, we said what they're proposing um, doesn't look like other fee structures. You know, they, they just want a large amount back ended. And most of them have, you know, a certain percentage at a lower amount and then it, it gradually builds. And I didn't see that coming back. So I didn't think there was a dialogue that you all had with the bar about what we thought was was, you know, more aligned with, with other programs. And did you have you physically talked with anybody over there? Several conversations with all, but yes. Okay. Uh, but but seeing as it's not going to get approved uh, anyway until November, let's put it on uh, in the September. Okay. Well, does anybody believe that what's proposed is is acceptable fee, fee structure? 
I, I haven't read the numbers. Well, maybe we should handle it this uh, way. Let's combine them for September. If if someone wants to look at the piece structure, um, provide their comments directly to, to, to George. I can see that on the low end, there is a marginal increase in the amount of fees that you would get. I was just going through the proposed versus what you've had since 2013. But I'm not sure if financially it solves your problems. So you may, it, it may behoove Alma to actually look at the, um, the case spread that you've had in the past three years. Like she, she did it in totals, but she should do amounts in dispute so she can figure out if the filing fee would actually increase and to what amount. And then you may just want to get one of the staggered or uh, structures from one of the other um, uh, 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 local bars. Although um, that was sort of my reaction to uh, our approval of uh, uh, Sacramento. So that I, don't, I don't know that what, what we approved for Sacramento was actually going to help them out either. Exactly, that was my criticism. Right. So, uh, but that's, I think, what you know, Lorraine has that initial, uh, well, I, I don't understand this. But more importantly, does it actually help you? So, yeah. um, you just sure. it, it, it did. Did? did because on this one, it would seem that if you most of your uh, things in dispute were in the five to ten thousand dollar level, you would actually be making a little bit more money. But as you went up, you'd have to get over fifty thousand dollars then in order to get that seven thousand um, dollar, you know, start getting into the sweet spot. If that makes sense, right? Yeah, George. Yeah, uh, we did that in Ventura, where we actually did a, a three-year study and a spread and figured out what we needed. And the one thing that offends me a little bit here is what I'm reading is that it looks like um, it's ten percent or more for the thousand-dollar um, arbitration, and really that ought to be. The fifty or fifty dollar one, right? That it's gradually yeah sliding up, and you make it up on the the big bucks, which are usually caused because some attorney failed to adequately monitor their cases and the payments, and can afford it. You know, maybe Joe, that, you can send um, like a comment with that type of fee structure to George, because you know I, I think George is fairly new on the committee and. Um, yeah. Well, also, too, the, these, it's been my experience, especially as an APA during doing the uh, 1,000 and under cases, those often mean more to the litigants in terms of do I have enough milk money and that kind of thing than anything else, and to charge 10% or more to get that dispute resolved is a tough, tough burden. And I would like to see them lower that but make it up by doing a study of what they need from the upper end to make their ends meet. All right, so we'll combine um, G and K for September, and maybe Joel and any other members want to give some examples so it's concrete that you can take back to Alma and the, the program chair. Um, and then, um, I believe we have model rules for mediation, so you just need to compare them with the model rules. Sort of do that um, great dialogue that Roy and Joel did. You know, this rule complies, this rule doesn't comply. Plus, if you use the model rules, they'll get adopted a lot yeah. rather than us going to I don't know if they use the model rules. I didn't. I, didn't. Want to do I don't think we have model. I don't think we have model rules. We have a packet of uh, suggested forms that mediation program should use. Um, so I can send all that material to you. Um, I think it's in the program advisories. Um, there are no, we, we have my, my, Joby worked on it, and that's why okay. I, Joby and I, I, I yeah, Joby and Malcolm were the wait. It was me team, tag team. Oh, and then I got Joby and Malcolm on board to say they okay. were okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> so so we, we, we do have model rules, don't we, Nick? Huh? I, we do have model rules on yes. mediation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, as well as uh, uh, forms that go along right, with everything. Right. I've, I've seen the forms. I didn't see the actual right. rules. Yeah. And, and the forms, um, I, I got quite a number of them from LACPA, pardon me, not LACPA, Los Angeles Superior Court from the okay. 
their uh, old mediation program. Okay. All right, a couple of um, really quick uh, items. H, discuss the impact of the new rules of professional conduct. Um, we can put that over to September, but we need volunteers that are, um, can actually go through uh, all of our materials. It's training, it's the sample form fee agreements, if an advisory cited a, a PR role, um, we pretty much have to do a search and replace. So if anybody wants to volunteer to do that, that Roy? Yeah. I didn't see Carol raising her hand, but I think you were the one that suggested this. Yeah. If you want to do it, yeah. I will, yes, okay. absolutely. Okay, great. Um, and then the other item um, that was on a to be determined is Jay discuss arbitrator quality assurance methods. Um, that's sort of a large topic. Um, that I think Anahib um, suggested be added to our agenda. So we actually need some structure to it. I, so I don't, I don't if anyone wants to volunteer, um, how we would put together some sort of, um, again, structure to well, ensure. Well, I was counting on the cu accumulated experience and knowledge of all these members to help me out because I, I really don't know. I just know that the quality of, of arbitrators we're getting, both temperamentally and uh, uh, in LA, both temperamentally and competence-wise is just, it's subpar. And you, you know, we've tried to address it at the LA County Bar. I have no idea. I, there's nothing in place to, for quality control, and I don't even know if we can do anything. But I was just hoping we could, you know, sort of spitball it because I, I, I'm, I'm frustrated. Yeah. I mean, off the top of my head, you know, you, you, when you're first looking for any candidate in a job, volunteer, foundation board, you get an application, you know, that gives you some basic bio information about the person. So, you know, maybe we need to, uh, and I'm talking off the top of my head, have a uniform application which has qualities that we believe would translate into an excellent arbitrator. Um, and then beyond that, maybe we have the second tier which is, uh, I think it's also always helpful to just have a, a phone conversation with the person to see you know, are they articulate? You know, their thinking process. Um, so maybe set up a, a uniform set of standards that come from us that we can suggest to the local program. Because I think all we can do is suggest. Joel. Yeah, uh, I, I was the chair of the LA committee when we first brought that up, and it was very frustrating. It isn't that you're not. It isn't that you're picking arbitrators who just come out at you as being terrible. I mean, they all look good. But then one of them is away for an extended trip in Europe and their award doesn't come in. One of them develops an ego and won't change it when they've made an obvious mistake. They won't work well, they won't play well in the sandbox and that kind of stuff. And we formed a quality control committee, if you will, which looked at um, awards and suggest the only suggestion we had at the time was that we ought to force those people to go through a subsequent training if they want to get another assignment. Uh, I shortly thereafter left the LA program and I don't know what happened to it although I'm obviously it didn't happen. So right, we don't have a quality control at, I, I mean nothing per se like that but you know, we have vice chairs who review the awards, and we do try to, we not drop, drop, well, I should say, we do try to speak to the arbitrators, some of whom are very, very hesitant uh, to be told what the law is, to be told, you know, that um, they shouldn't include certain things in their awards, like, you know, she came dressed like, you know, a tart, 
I, you know, you don't say things like that. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, no more assignments to that. Person. Well, but that's that's our quality control. But you know, my my take on it is some of these people might be remedial. <laughs> they could be helped, but you know, there's Send just no uh, probationary no, arbitration school. But there's no teeth. There are no teeth in it. Is what I'm saying. I mean, it's it's one of the problems of volunteers are, you know. Quite frankly, not everyone is as committed as, you know, we are. And uh, their attitude is, and I've, ha I've actually had this, I've been practicing longer than you've been alive, little girl. I'm not going to listen to you. Yeah. You know, and it's like, okay, Sharon, take this guy off the list. Right. But, you know, we would like to be able to, and, and it is amazing, they're, they're attorneys and they're supposed to be wordsmiths. And, they can't put three words together to form a sentence. Yeah. Um, and so I just didn't know, you, you know. Does, someone, um, does anybody want to work with Anahid on help me. coming up with a st structure? Well, um, I don't, I don't and, think and that my, our program, even the way that we select arbitrators, is as uh, detailed as what Isabel just like laid out right, we don't for the state bar program. If you're breathing, we'd like I mean, to. If you go through an advanced training program and you fill out the application and then you just get into the system and does Sharon it, will put you on a panel. Does anybody check to s their state bar I mean, record to see if they've been disciplined? Something, but that, there's no like Or, or on the application, have, have you or, been sued for malpractice? Have you had disciplinary action on your license? Do you have an active license with the state bar? You know? I, I don't know what, what, what yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. gonna look into that. I just maybe, strangely maybe assume that Isabel that can send done. you the form that the state bar uses for state bar arbitration. Would you do that? Thank you. And I think that would be a good starting point. Mm -hmm. And then maybe we could develop, you know, uh, the second part is an interview process just to, you know, talk to the person. So a couple of things that may or may not help in the process. First of all, this committee's done a lot where we started with the advanced training. Um, arbitrator training and now we've transformed that into how to write an arbitration award. So we're doing everything we can on this level. Um, and what we did in Sonoma County, we might have played to our part state bar, there's a letter that goes out congratulating people, for example, on their reappointment or continuing to serve as an arbitrator. And it looks like you haven't taken the training within this many years. And in order to keep current, we ask that you take this training and or this new training has come out and how to write no more. And then we keep a list of, of when they've taken those trainings. We also review all of the arbitration awards so we know the challenges are, and there are a handful of, if you're looking at 10 or 20, there's a few people that always act like that. And if they do, and they're unwilling to listen or unwilling to participate, be a part of the solution rather than the problem, then you're just not going to use them as arbitrators anymore, no matter how difficult it is to, to get arbitrators. But I think a lot of them comes out. That's a great track, idea. I know. track saying you've been here for a while, but you're current. Yeah, but my county, Contra Costa, keeps current on all our education. And so. so I have that letter that I've kind of changed, which yes. you can use my letter or you can use the state bar letter that goes out to the arbitrators. But I, there's a change to the and I'm happy to send it to you. I mean, Ellen County Bar now I think is having a bit of a problem because we just lost one of our staff people, uh, and it doesn't look like they're going to hire another one, um, and they just don't give enough resources to the ACMAS committee. And I've been on that committee for something like 15 years. It's, it's just never been um, properly you know, maintained to do the types of things, but I'll, but if, yeah, Isabel, if you can send me that, if, uh, Michael, you, you can uh, send me the further letter, I'll, I'll yep. suggest it and see what happens. Um, that can only help, So the way I look at it. Yeah, and if we develop it from, you know, the state bar, and, and then once we get what we believe is a, a good system, we can, you know, send a blast out to all the local programs saying, you know, if you've been having problems with quality control, these are the, this is the structure that we have, you know, vetted and 
we suggest you put in place. That's a great idea, yeah. Thank you. Joel? Well, the ultimate that we did in Ventura when I was there is that, well, we had a group of arbitrators who would always be clamoring. They wanted more. They didn't, you know, so you had them, you could get them to do just about anything to get more. But ultimately, if they weren't going to listen, uh, you just stop assigning them matters, sure. period. Yeah, we do that now. And I know you've done that in LA. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I think we should think about after we've gotten through this advanced training is I think we should lean into the state bars education group, whoever that is, to create some sort of online refresher thing that is engaging and interesting that you could point people to, to say, you know what, you need to go like do this online program. And it doesn't need to be like where somebody's sitting in front of them, but it refreshes their mind about all the things they should think about. And it forces them to like get a refresher you know, they can do at home or in their office. The problem is that that, that only, you know, attracts the, the conscientious, diligent the arbitrator the who person, he or she is already, no, but you know, what I'm saying I is love them. The person that is a problem, you say, look, in order for you to continue on to get assignments, you have to go through the program, and you have, you have to go take this online program, and you have, to, and like, there's a test at the end, or whatever it is, so that we know at least they went through it. This letter that I'm talking about makes it look like they're not, set, um, they're not singled out. Right. That it, it's for recurrence. We need to continue. And then if they don't want to do it, then you know they're not interested, and that's a way for you to say bye bye. If they go to it, then you've got a chance to modify that by showing them some of the very tools that you work so hard to create. And that's going to make a huge difference for those people because you're giving them. A, a template to go, oh, this is a lot easier. And then you'll get the I mean, look, having the sample system. award, I can just tell you, I, I had a I had one as the vice chair the lady sent me and it was she had taken the skeleton that Ami Heed had like done. Perfect and as it is. She had <laughs> filled in the blanks in the skeleton and she said, I did I filled it in and I said, Yeah it's not a filling. Like, it's like you put like, you know It's not a judicial council form. You didn't like <laughs> you didn't put any meat in here and She's like, I don't understand what you mean. And I said, okay, I'm going to send you a sample award. I want you to read it. To write. And I want you to see like what one's supposed to look like. And then it forced her to like, she actually rewrote it. Like, you didn't think she was going to do it. But well, I didn't. She, Somebody who comes in and says, you know, like that, I don't think they're going to do she, it. She actually did it. But I think this having the sample award is now going to be very helpful. Very because yeah. now I've got something that I can like, and we will have something. All the, I, I think it's something that we should be, once we get this thing done, is about, we should put something together, like a memo or something, that sends it out to all of the local programs to say, here's a sample that your program can start using to show people how the award's supposed to look. No, that's what we up. always do. If there's a new advisory, I don't know if you receive them, but as soon as it comes from the state bar, I get it as a contra Costa bar member. So... It, it, you know, Doug used to do it, and, and this form should now go out. I, yeah, I call it a blast. So. Can, can I ask, does your program have a dispute resolution procedure where, for example, clients or attorneys can complain about something that happened at the arbitration? If by that you mean they have our emails and they no. use it without any regard for... Okay. Well, I, I think what we found in our local program well, was that when I handled them, I would sometimes get two or three a month uh, complaints primarily from clients and primarily on appearance of bias issues. So we use that information to develop training. Well, we do. We have an evaluation uh, uh, form at the end of the, um, of the hearing and uh, I, I mean, and we have our vice chair meetings where I mean issues that come up to Sharon, right? That are so but a formal person that's been designated, to, yeah. To hear right, no, it, 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 we don't have fact, that. We've sometimes even even uh, reassign hearings based on problems that at, at no, we, we no, that, we do have we do have that kind of that were so severe that we believe.
leading even before the award issue. So I think if you have a procedure like that, I think you'll get a pretty good idea of what the problems are with your arbitrations and who the problem arbitrators are. And, and, and it took us probably three to five years to train this appearance of bias problem out. And some of our biggest offenders were the most seasoned arbitrators, right? The ones who knew everybody in the local legal community and felt it was okay to arbitrate cases for their buddies. But, but without that information, we, we wouldn't have known what, what to focus on. We, then we actually, we actually even did focus training um, in addition to doing uh, um, basic fee arbitration and advanced fee arbitration. We did, we did specialized training on, on avoiding the appearance of bias, for example. In, or implicit in, you know, bias. Well, we did implicit bias training too. Yeah, yeah. there's a second one we did too. So I think, you, you know, I think if you get some empirical information that you can, that you can work off of. And, and, and you know, we, we shadow banned a few arbitrators too. Yeah, we had to because there were ones that just didn't, you know, they didn't get the clue. And, and they were still overt in their problems with, with handling this appearance of, of bias issue, whether it was biased against a law firm or, or a client. So, but I think you can, I think you can, you know, look at what the issues are that happen at your arbitrations, and over time you'll see what those issues are and who the arbitrators are, and you and you can focus on those. I think pretty pretty easily. And then, as we all know, it's it's the arbitrators that give you the resistance that you spend most of your time managing. So why why continue to, yeah. you know. Have the headache, just get rid of the headache, you know. And but that's quality control, where you know you, you know, if it's not reviewing an award, it's having someone that is there to hear the complaints. Yeah, I, I mean, if you're having to review, having problems with an arbitrator's award more than once, you know, you should continue to have them write awards. And no, we don't. And, yeah. and Roy. <laughs> yeah, Roy. Uh, how do we get in touch with and work with the people who write those online training sessions that we take as temporary judges? If we could get that same type of program and oh, as yeah. refresher, my, 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 my county, great. We, I, I just went through requirements because they changed them from three to two years. Um, but so Pro Tem is it, a combination of what Lee said. So Seeger has a whole bunch of online courses. So, yeah. we, so we have to do the online Seeger course, uh, California Judges Continuing Education. Um, and you actually um, have to click at the end and print right. off your certificate. So it's not one of these things that you could say, I did it. Right. And then um, there's in-person training for the calendars you handle. And then everybody has to do um, judicial demeanor in so I, I think a combination of the same sort of structure, a co an online remedial, if you identify someone that's you know having problems with an award, after you put them on your panel, then there's got to be you know revetting if they surface as you know as an issue. The problem, the problem with the TJ program and the. Um, fee dispute arbitrator program is a lot of people in the TJ program, uh, and I'm not speaking to anyone who does the program here or is a TJ on uh, an active basis, but the, uh, I suspect that the demographics are a little different and the intent is a little different from the participant. So that a TJ, a lot of them I've spoken with, you know, they think that somehow they're going to get appointed to the bench if they just put on that nice black robe, and so they want to continue with the training and but you um, can't you can't serve. It's it's statutory. If you don't no, no, comply I, with, th with with I, these programs, the, you'll never that's sit the as point. A that's yeah. the point I'm I'm yeah. making. But with the arbitrators that we have in this program, um, there is no statutory basis for training or retraining. There's no um, there's nothing. That's why I always say there's no teeth to this. But there it's could just be a local we rule. The committee I, could, could make I, a rule absolutely, that absolutely, that. Absolutely, absolutely. It can. Yeah, that, that, that these are our requirements, and if you don't meet them, you'll never hear a case. And, you know, from the perspective, you got to think about, um, you know, our volunteer arbitrators, they're hearing officers. So the same qualities that you would want 
in a judge or in a temporary judge or a court of appeal justice or a Supreme Court justice mm -hmm. you want in an arbitrator. Absolutely. It's the same quality. When, when I sit as a vice chair and those arbitrators call me, the, the ones who call me to ask for certain information before they hear a case, sometimes I get called during the proceeding itself. Those are the ones you want to hold on to because even if they don't start out being brilliant, uh, there there's hope in, in that. It's the ones who aren't going to reach out because they, you know, when they were born, they knew everything, and there's nothing else that can be, you know, provided. So, okay, but I, I got a lot of information. I appreciate it. I'm going to get some stuff from Great. Eva. I'm going to get some stuff from my. Um, Great, thank you. Okay, I, let's take our lunch break. I know we got oh. lunch. Can they ask for a writing sample? I was, I already wrote that note to myself. <laughs> because uh, I mean, that's our that's our primary problem. And I'll ask for a write, writing sample that they wrote. Well, of course. Because I have <laughs> <a system. laughs> All right, we're we're off the record for our lunch break. I was watching. Are you I implying should, that someone's doing that? Oh, you are. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. It's about a minute. It's about when 20 I, seconds. When I was looking for a job, when I got out of law school, some of the law firms asked me. It looks good. I mean, I'm going to send a job as a Cindy or not profit. We're, we're ready to go. Um, continuing on with uh, business. Um, item B, arbitration advisory on interest. Um, Joel or Mike wants to take the lead on that. All I'm going to say is, since the last time uh, I was here, we did the committee met, and we wanted to make changes to the advisory of the individual aid. And since that time, I know that Nick was going to go in and rework and simplify the calculation of interest, which I think we're doing a good job on. Um, I'm not aware of any other changes that need to be made, but I'm certainly open to anybody else has to say or recommend. All right, anybody have uh, comments on the draft? No comments, that's a first. No, I'm looking. Well, it's only been two years of getting uh, <laughs> that's right. four <laughs> done, so. Clark's looking. You want well, if I, what, I read this yesterday, so I would have made notes. If I, the, why do you have any comments? Uh, just a couple of hits. Uh, the page 35 paragraph that starts with saying it's true. I think the word provide should really be providing. What, okay, is it paragraph 2 or paragraph 3? Uh, it's in the middle of paragraph 2. It, the, the saying is true even if. And the word, the 
uh, word provide really should be providing. All right, we're on uh, paragraph two. Um, the third, the, it starts the third. with the same is true. Providing. providing, change provide to providing ing. The, the, the complying written contract providing for the attorney rather than provide for the attorney. Yeah. Well, if I look, if you look at the whole sentence, Roy, it, it doesn't make as long as the there yeah, is a statutorily right. compliant. Yeah, the should come out. Yeah. <laughs> So we're going to delete B. What page are we on? I'm sorry. We're on 35, paragraph 2, the paragraph third down starts with the same is true. So we're going to, as long as, delete D. And then second sentence, providing, instead of provide. And then in, in the first paragraph of 3, uh, applicable statutory rate. <laughs> at the applicable statutory rate? Yeah. It, so it, insert... It, it, it reads now the applicable statutory is different. It should be statutory rate wow. is different. Yeah, I don't like the then either, but uh, looking at that. What, yeah, delete then. Or the applicable statutory rate. All right, anything else, uh, Roy? Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> Last line on page, material page 35. You might as well go ahead and bite the bullet. Uh, CRPC 4200 should be changed to a CRPC 1.5. Well, that's a good question. Um, the rules don't become effective. Is it November 1st, Carol? Correct. Yeah. So this is going to come out before November 1st. Well, you can yeah. put in yeah. whatever that is, day. which, which, if it becomes effective. Well, it's right. not an if. Or why, well, no, it why is, don't we leave it, it if it is? But, well, then maybe we ought to put uh, CRPC rule 1.5 formerly for 200, and that way they're going to look at it if they want to. Because it's yeah, going to be formal. Yeah, then we wouldn't have to go back and change <coughs> that, right? Yeah, or you can put on it. Yeah, or you can put on it. Yep. Well, we're going to be changing a lot of rule numbers yeah. uh, later so, so on. Let's, that's the well, one in here. That's why I thought we'd do it. <laughs> I mean, you know, do we want to do the changes now or or wait? Because if, if this is going to come out thoughts? before November first, I don't think we should make the change. Because if this is going to come out before November first, so we don't have those rules. You know, that are cited under the new rule yet. It, it's up to you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I would change well, it now, I, I'm but gonna open it to discussion. I'll Carol. stand. Yeah, one thing I one thing I would say is um, since we know for sure there is going to be a new rule as of November one, <coughs> and this document will live after that. We may want to put in there. Carol, is your microphone on? Oh, sorry. Maybe not. Okay, sorry. What oh, I was saying better. is since since we know for sure this opinion will live after a rule change. And we know for sure that rule is changing November 1. We may want to reference the current rule and then do a footnote on it and say effective November 1, new rule number. Perfect. Does that sound like a plan? I think that's an excellent way to handle it. All right. Um, I, I know it all said on the email on changes, but um, I think just for clarity, I think the people that worked on the draft, you should track changes because. Unless Isabel agrees to be your administrative assistant and provide the documents, we've had an issue with that in this last go around. So either Joel or Mike has to track these changes that we've just made. Is someone doing that? Michael. Well, I am now. This is, who's this, who's this scrivener? I don't hear anybody. I'm, I'm doing it, but I only have the one change now, so I haven't gone through and done the other changes. So we're going to have to backtrack and repeat what those are if you want me to do this. Okay, program. so let's do that, because I, I didn't think that was happening. All right, so um, check me, Roy, or do you want to go go and say what they are? I, 
Right. So the paragraph that starts with the same is true. Oh. Second sentence. Yeah, um, we're deleting the, deleting the in the first line. Right. Wait, 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 wait. As long as delete the. I thought. Too. Okay, you're. Oh, you're in the doc. I know. You're in the bed. So let's, go ahead. Tell me what you want the sound. As long as the there. The first line of that paragraph, take out the, and in the second line, change provide to providing. And then in the first paragraph of section three. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. I don't have the printout version of this, so I have to make my notes here. I don't need that. Thank you. section 3, insert the word rate after statutory. And I'm not sure, did we decide to take out then? Or yeah, not? it's that, it's, yeah. it's or, the, delete, then. So it would read or the applicable statutory rate, if different. Where are you looking at now? Read the whole sentence to me. It's in the print part, uh, where it starts. Uh, or when there's no written agreement which specifies a rate of interest, the arbitrator shall award simple interest at the rate of 10% per annum, parentheses, or the applicable statutory rate of difference, close parentheses. Got it. Right. And I already have the, um, <coughs> the footnote for CRPC 4-200A. Reflect that back in November 1st. I think we're just going to keep it in the sentence, not, not putting out it. C, C and then um, set the new rule and then put formally <coughs> CRCP. Well, it's not formally at the time this is coming yeah. out. Put, just footnote that it's going to be effective November 1st. I didn't think we were going to do it as a footnote. What was your language, Carol? Well, I thought we should cite the currently effective rule, but just do a note that. As of November 1, there will be a new rule and give the number. Oh. That's what I thought. And then I've got a question about the post interest award. Uh, we've been talking all along so about you on, how on important page this 37, is. Page um, 37. Paragraph 4. Right. We've been talking about how important it is to have this provision, and I don't know what the statutory authority for it is. Which provision are you referring to? Post award interest. The, the, the mandatory post award in, uh, interest. What's the question? Roy doesn't know the statutory. Um, yeah, what, what, what's our authority for, for that? post award interest? I don't have it on the top of my head. Um, All judgments get posted. Yeah. It's in the, it's in the side. Yeah, we could cite it, but any judgment approves. Yeah. All judgments interest at the legal, legal interest. Rate. But the, the, it's, in, it's in the guidelines and minimum standard for the PO. Yeah, but this is saying it uh, accrues interest starting in 30 days. And just, right, because you've got to allow the period that's for the, the That's in the guidelines and oh. minimum standards. Okay, okay. I, I just okay. I wasn't aware of the specifics of how we got to that. Yeah, yeah that, we, we that, just that, didn't make it up, Roy. Okay. <laughs> do, we, do we want to cite those references or not? I have a, a well. note that we should cite the reference in line, too. So. Okay. So um, the problem is, at that point, you're citing to minimum standards. No, it's in the civil. It's um, I know you have to. You have to actually go into the exactly the civil code. I don't want to do it because um, it's going to go on the record if I ask Siri. <laughs> Maybe someone else can do it. Um, so we just want to need the civil code section for the statutory interest. Yeah. No, no problem. And in the guidelines. Of Minimum standard 16. It's what? Minimum standard 16. 
So where do we want to insert that? Where does it make sense in that paragraph? We'll just, we'll just cite it at the end. Yeah. yeah. Parentheses. Parentheses at the end. Okay. And I'll look up that code section right now as we're speaking. 685.01 to... Is what? 685.010. 685.010. There we go. <coughs> I've got it. Interest accrues at the rate of 10% per annum on the principal amount of the money judgment remaining unsatisfied. Does that sound right? Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah. yeah, the 30 days for fee ARB is because that's when the award's fine. Yeah. Right, if you only request a NOVA within that 30 day okay. period. All right, any more um, comments? Carol? I thought on the new paragraph that's in red on page 35 um, that it should have some citation of some authority. It's the fourth paragraph under um, subpart two. I think that is a correct proposition, um, but I don't see any authority there. So I think it, elsewhere in the opinion we've got authority for everything, so I thought that kind of jumped out to me. Well, that's what we were just talking about, that paragraph. No, that's, that's, uh, reasonable fee, I, I think we could cite, well, the, the oh, analogous yeah. um, section is, well, this, the interest it, it's, fix, it's not fixed and ascertainable, yeah. it's yeah. the civil code 3267. Yeah. Under the code section, well, it's got to be fixed. So, and, ascertainable. and a reasonable fee is never going to be a fix. I think there is a case that says Yeah, that. I think there is too, but so do we know I think it's 3267. Um, but well, Clark know. can check me. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> Go to Clark. It's, it's uh, yeah, try 3267. That's probably in my head. 3287. 3267 or 87? Yeah, okay. 87. 3287 is the Civil code. Yeah, that's what. It, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's yeah. our authority. So you want to add that after uh, the, the last sentence where it says when the award is issued in the interest of civil code 3287? Well, if I may, when I joined the committee, one of the first things I did was a training with Joel of Santa Barbara, and we made this statement. And I said, is that always true? And Joel, of course, being Yoda, said yes. So that's enough for me. Yeah. But I actually went and I did some research on it. Yeah. I mean, it, it is absolutely right. I went through all the machinations, but I could not find a case that states that. Well, that when you're dealing with a quantum merit recovery, meaning that it's got to be a factual distinction, that somehow you were able to collect um, that interest. But it ties into the interest section that says, your first, be, your first analysis saying, is right. what is the interest section, but it's fixed and ascertainable. A reasonable fee analysis can never can never jive with fixed and ascertainable. Yeah. The first sentence, 3287A says, a person who's entitled to recover damages certain, certain. or capable of being made certain by calculation and the right to which recover, which is vested in the person fund, et cetera is entitled to recover interest. Ergo, if it's not ascertainable, they're not entitled right. to interest from yeah. that day. So I think we only have to cite 3287A. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. I was gonna say, I, don't we have a cite for that in the reasonable fee advisory? Yeah, we do. I, I we think do. there's a cite for that proposition right. in that advisory. You mean a case cite? Uh, we can look up uh, But the, when I get training, I, I throw out the 2012 one the new one, right? Yeah. Oh, it, it's the longest one. It's not, no, it's 1998. 1998-01. Nobody. The reasonable fee one. Yeah, no, I was trying to find where. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. You have to go through 10 drop-down menus. There we go. Advisory. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
I think I think um, silicone's good now, don't you think? Yeah, I thought there was a site there. I'm just scrolling through and not seeing it right now. Yeah. So let's just put silicone section 3287A. All right. Any other questions, comments? All right. Is there a motion to approve the interest? Advisory with the um, changes made. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So who's going to word process that and get it to Isabel? I am. Okay. I made the changes. And, and then she'll put the um, heading on it. Um, what is spelled though? Yeah. There's so a, I can actually I can take the um, PDF and open it up and make the changes. There's a typo on the last page on. So just, it needs to be spell check. Where, where's the typo? Unconscionable. Okay. On the last oh, you're page. right. Where's that? It's the very last word. word. Unconscionable in the conclusion. It's the last yeah. word of the. Um, yeah. So we need a C in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, moving right along. Um, Agenda item C, arbitration advisory on costs. Um, this is Joel and, and Ken, who wants to take the lead on that one? Okay. Does that mean I'm doing it? Uh, do we have anything new to report? We didn't, we didn't get around to it. No, this has been back, what? This is our fourth trip, I think. And yeah, uh, there, was some, just, there was some changes from the last one, then. With the eye surgery, I never got around to doing anything. So I thought Isabel, Isabel, did you make the changes? Because I thought you and Ken compared notes and yeah, no, we made the changes. And, uh, yeah, Isabel gave, gave she had written down some notes and we put them all in here. Yeah, there were some superficial notes, but I those know, were just the notes. So there was some yeah. rewriting that had to happen, Carol and that had didn't happen. Carol had some concerns about the lack of uh, private resources because a lot of them were yeah. um, practice guides and things like that. So I think that's a that was a general concern, not an edit that we actually made. I, I also think we might want to take that section A and write a narrative rather than just saying these are some things that apply. Yeah, Carol, I was I was thinking we should just get rid of section A entirely because all those authorities are mentioned. If they're not, we can easily make them so. And then just talk about general considerations. Either way, I agree. Yeah. But, but to just list them there, it doesn't really, that's not the style of our typical word product. So, yeah. yeah. So what's your pleasure to go through page by page and get comments right now with someone assigned a scrivener that I'm under scribbing. penalty of perjury is going to make the changes? And <laughs> I'm scribbing. You're scribbing. <laughs> so I, I, I think let's take the time because um, ironically we've got some time. Um, so... Why don't we start with page 38? Comments on 38, we'll start with Roy. Please. Uh, it, it just sounds, no, there's no comments on the 38. Comments. I don't see it. Well, I can't let it start on page 40. Okay. Okay, but on 38, I'm going to get Let me just do page by page. One second, this is not complete. This isn't. Why is it not There was, last time we went over it, and there was some discussion about substantive changes and rewriting that had to be done. I didn't do that because I was out with surgery. Noel had his issues. He didn't deal with it either. So, so what do you want to do, Ken? It has to come back. We haven't done the review. But we, we should use the time if people have yes. comments. There was a draft of, that I sent to Isabel that had the notes and the sections that... Yeah, we're, we're, getting, we're getting over that. It's not no, here. No, he sent me all the time. The, the comments and the things that needed to be redrafted from last time is not in this document here, so we're treading over old ground. You told me not to put it in, so I put the ones that I had in the trash that I put in from my notes. Because you sent me two versions. You 
Can, can I cut through this? It needs to because come back. we're in a loop here. Yeah, it needs to come back. It needs to come back, but I think we should use our time here because we do have time to just go with what we have page by page. Anybody puts in their comments? That's fine. Joel is our scrivener. He's going to word process it and it'll come back in September. So, any comments that you have reading through each page, make them known now. So let's start with 38. I think there was a um, consensus that um, we need to get rid of that key authorities paragraph. Yeah. And okay. Rewrite it, I guess. If we get rid of it, we don't need the B general considerations heading. On page 38, we should have citations for the first two sentences underneath. I mean, we can incorporate those sites into yeah. the narrative below. That's, That's what probably I would the way to do it. Start out with um, A, general considerations. Well, there won't be a B. Oh, yes, I'm yeah, sorry. Well, yes, we'll, there is. Why is this rolling in? I think it's awkward just having key. You're, you're starting out without, you know, um, it just it looks awkward to me. I've never seen an advisory that bumps out the key authorities at the beginning. That's my suggestion. Um, just from the top, yeah, right. If you wanted to have a quick reference, you pull out the pull this out, and right there you can see 4200, 6148, 6147 without going through the whole advisory. So I don't know that it's problematic having, but I, I don't, I don't I'm think not, those I'm not wedded to it. I don't think those authorities give you enough in context. Yeah, just I think, pulling I think them out I, doesn't get you. Anywhere. I think you need a narrative to yeah. to, to link the link the thoughts to And as long as, Ken, you're making me rewrite this thing, I'm going to rewrite it the way I want to. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so but I think we should start out with A, and it'd be general considerations, you know, the right of entry to charge for costs as a matter of contract. If I may, second, that next sentence, however, the attorney should make a clear disclosure of the basis for the fee and any other charges to the client. That should be must make. You know, in most instances under 6147 and 6148A, those are those are one of the minimum statutory requirements. Right. I'll accept that. And then it says this is a twofold duty, including not only the explanation at the beginning of the engagement or engagement of the basis on which the fees and other charges we would bill, but also a sufficient explanation in the billing statements. So that the client may reasonably be expected to understand what fees and charges are actually being billed to the client. Period. Now, uh, I, I pointed out to Ken last time um, that we ended there. We don't. We we didn't take a, a stand, or we didn't discuss what happens if that doesn't happen in the written fee agreement. What happens if you don't identify the charges, the other charges other than the fee? cost, expenses, those things, in a fee agreement, and then try to collect them, or don't try to collect them, under 6148C, is the contract then avoidable, or avoidable at the client's option? Yeah. Well, That's, you just said there isn't a written fee agreement, so it's an oral agreement. No, no, I'm sorry, when, uh, when there is an agreement, but it doesn't include anything having to do then it's with- It's voidable. Yeah, is it then voidable? Voidable. Yeah, absolutely. Are we going to say that as, I mean, that's what the statute says. I, I've spoken to many of your colleagues doing malpractice and um, ethics, and they say the legislature never meant that. To be able to overturn or void a contract of thousands, if not tens of thousands, or hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees simply because the attorney did not include the fact that he's going to charge you 10 cents per page when he's going to charge you for photocopies. But then that goes into your analysis that you're not going to enforce the voidability right. part it's, of the, it's not the statute. It's not void, it's just voidable. It's avoidable. 
right. at the client's office. Right. So you, if you're of that opinion and it's a technical BS requirement, then you're not going to avoid the contract. Right. But that's, I, you can't say it's a BS requirement. You have to say it's a minimum statutory requirement. Yeah. You yeah. make the call, Mick. No. <laughs> you know, I yeah. just want a fee arbitration that, that they didn't have to pay costs for that very reason. So my hearing officer or retired judge agreed with me. The other side presented an expert witness that said the, the, just the opposite, your, your position. Are we taking a position as a committee? I think we put the law down that you know you it, you can find that if the statutory requirements aren't met that the contract is voidable. Maybe voidable at the client's option. Yeah. I think we should state that. So this basically paraphrase 6148C yeah, exactly. or 6147B. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Those are, I think those are the only two statutes that deal with the charges other than fees, correct? That we're interested in? Mm -hmm. So on 39, no. after that, those first three sentences, we'll, we'll add a paragraph about um, voidability under 6147C. Yeah. Uh, 6147B and 6148C. Okay. Oh, that. I don't know if it would be a new paragraph. Yeah, you yeah, I think it just needs a so little. You got, you got that, Joel? Yeah, I got it. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Excuse me. Okay. All right, at 39, any uh, comments or suggestions? I'm allergic to changes. I'm <laughs> to changes, yeah. Okay, what else? Anything else on 39? I had a question or a comment um, about the extensive site from the Rudder Group, which I think I heard somebody reference earlier, which is about the secondary nature of that authority. And it's a really important um, issue that we're addressing. Um, but the, you know, so in some places in the opinion, we seem to suggest that you can collect like photocopying charges. This quote says they're overhead. So really, you shouldn't collect them. So this was what was going to be rewritten for yeah, the last time. Yeah, it's inconsistent. Oh, I already probably said this before then. You did, yeah. yeah it's okay. Oh, we went all we are, we are that, that, That's around. what's not on this draft here is the comments and the sections are going to be rewritten. Okay. But let, let's, let's, let's resolve the issue. Well, so I think you have to start with, um, you know, the, the BMP requires that if you're going to charge costs, including copying, that it be in your fee agreement um, <coughs> and fully disclosed, which is what this last sentence says. But then the flip side is that some fee agreements, which I think are legitimate, subsume a percentage of the fee. And, you know, under that analysis, that amount can't be unconscionable. So I think you could, you could start out, this is just, you know, off the top of my head, you know, there are two ways that attorneys typically handle costs. They specifically provide for you know an amount. Some other lawyers add a percentage of the total fee for that month. That Either way, it has to be disclosed to the client and and be fair and not unconscionable. I think That's those are those are those are thoughts. That well, it's also I, I found it instructive in the Rudder Group discussion of all this is that it it is kind of a. Uh, it's important, I think, to give the discretion to the arbitrators, depending upon how the attorney has treated the costs. Um, well, then we can say that. If we want to say the arbitrator has discretion, depending on how the attorney has treated the costs, then that, I think that would be fine. But I think it's just confusing if somebody was really trying very hard to follow this, 
in one sentence we're saying one thing, in the next paragraph it's the opposite. So that's the only thing I wanted to clear up. Okay, well, there is no, there is no bright line. This is in all the research I did. There, we cannot draw a bright line. There's opinions on, not necessarily authorities, but opinions on both sides, depending upon what you're doing for copying. In other words, do you send it out or do you do it in-house? Is it more or less expensive? Is it a, a unique event or is it part of your regular overhead? Uh, those are all things, there's no bright line. So you kind of have to put both possibilities in. And then I agree, we can add maybe the, uh, as a penultimate uh, sentence uh, in that paragraph, discretion. Yeah, I think if we, if our conclusion is, there's a lot of different ways to do this. And here's what they are. And we think any of them are fine. And then if some of them are not fine, then We'll say what those are, but just so that we're not confusing people as to, you know, what is the ultimate conclusion? You can charge for copies, or you can't. Right. So I, I think with those concepts, Joel, you could come up with some language that basically I got it. encapsulates the thought. I got There are it. various ways that you could charge costs. You know, if you do okay. it this way, get your client's consent and the agreement. If you have it a percentage of overhead, it can't be unconscionable. You can't do 10% of the monthly fee or something. Nick? Just quickly following up on what just Carolyn and Joel talked about. Notwithstanding what was said, I think our, the, uh, the emphasis of this advisory should be on the discretion the arbitrator has. Because I'd hate to highlight the different positions and then uh, provide possible best practices, which an attorney then uh, uses, only to be you know uh, thwarted when even the fee dispute with a fee arbitrator who's using his discretion. So I think maybe we just show the, the range, show that there is no bright line, and say that the arbitrator has discretion. Maybe but, we can put that up in the intro where it says the purpose of this advisory is to provide guidance to the MFA arbitrators regarding such disputes that arise from time to time. Um, well, but you should exercise your discretion in, in deciding these issues. But there are some of these things which are bright line issues. Well, that's what we have to differentiate. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, there are there is some absolute case authority which affects some of these things. So Those are discussed in the next section. Because this is the this is the general stuff. The breakdown on specific things is in the next part C. So are there any large general thoughts on 39 and then we can move on to the next page? All right, so 40. I know Roy had 40 comments. Yeah, uh, it's been over 60 years since I was a newspaper editor, but you can't take the editor out of the body. Uh, <laughs> In the paragraph starting overhead, about the fourth line down, uh, I think we need to take out that word additional and insert the word that so that the sentence reads, a contingent percentage of the amount recovered or otherwise, the reasonable expectation of your client would be that charges for general office overhead are included. Wait, wait, wait. He's on overhead. C, overheads, the second paragraph? Right, but the, I can't the, find the sentence. The, the third and fourth the lines sentence. of that paragraph. It's the first sentence, fourth line. The, the reasonable word, expectation of the client would be that charges for general office overhead are included. Would be that. So you want to insert that. Instead insert of that. Additional, instead of additional. Okay. All right, start over fourth line and it be additional. Instead of additional, Strike that. additional and insert that. Okay, sorry, I thought I'd do it now. It's my go to you all the time. Um. All right, any other um, changes on 40 or large concepts? Yeah, well, I, I said this before. I have issues with uh, uh, In Ray Tom Carter, particularly as it has to do with uh, uh, general overhead where it's not recoverable. 
that's predicated on the bankruptcy court's you know, absolute discretion, irrespective of a contract, to determine what is recoverable in bankruptcy. And, and I'm just not sure it's very instructive in this context. And in fact, it contradicts what we just said on top. Why wouldn't it be instructive for an arbitrator to know that a, a court has heard this particular issue in a different context, and that's how it's resolved? And that's what but C means. And there's a different yeah. opinion or a take on it. Yeah. Because we're never going to see fee disputes arising out of a bankruptcy estate. It has to be then argued before a bankruptcy judge. Right. Yeah. So, uh, I, I, and it does nothing to aid our arbitrators. I don't know. I mean, I could look at that case and maybe see something in there, uh, reasoning that might help me. Oh, there is some reasoning in the case itself, but that's that's a, a, a precise I, statement that a lot of people are not going to be able to um, uh, uh, decipher well, the subtlety of. Okay, I, I can give you that. I think some of us are denser well, than others. Well, Tom Carter is sprinkled throughout this. <laughs> this was one of the rewrites we talked about last time. Right, right. Not on this draft. Right. But, that, but that, that, that's my observation. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've only done one fee dispute out of a, a bankruptcy estate, and it was through LACPA, and it was a referral from the bankruptcy judge. But throughout my entire award, I kept, I kept saying, this is what it would be under state court, the ultimate decision rests upon, you know, applicable rec uh, bankruptcy statute regulations and uh, laws. But we would never have, like you said, fee are right. for bankruptcy because exactly. they they're always have to be approved by the bankruptcy court. Exactly. So. Well. But, um, okay. In, in the draft, the two, it, the two was there paragraphs are inconsistent. I mean, ABA Formal Opinion ninety three three seventy nine says as much, general overhead's not recoverable. So, um, well, what we talked, what we, like I said, this is what we talked about last time, the discussion was that parking, depends on what it is. If you're parking at your office, that could be an overhead item. If you're going to court or you're going to a mediation or a deposition, there's a parking fee, that's a cost. Irrespective yeah, of what anybody Tom Carter might think the bankruptcy fees. So that was one of the things that was gonna be softened and discussed the various factors and analysis. Has anybody ever saw an attorney trying to pass their office parking on to the client? Yes. Yeah. Seriously? Yes. Large firms, when they bring in a bunch of subcontractors for uh, document reuse, they, they itemize parking, uh, office space, lunches, off-site facilities, and it's in the contract uh, because they anticipate that that's what we're going to do when you know you, you uh, take on these cases. So it's in the first contract with the contract lawyer, no, not it's the client. In, it, no, with the client. Okay, and the clients agree to it. Oh, they have to. Yeah. You're you're asking us to you know take over this case. You know the trial is less than you know six months away or five months away. We're going to have to hire all these people to come up to speed. With what's happening, it's gonna we're gonna have to recreate the wheel. Yeah. I mean, they're very precise in what they said. So, is the consensus of the committee that we take out Tom Carter? I, I just don't think it's authority for us because we never would have a bankruptcy case that deals with you know parking and luncheon. So, just like an unpublished opinion might be helpful to me if I read so. it. Uh, and don't know the it, its existence until I, you know, find out about it and read it. That doesn't mean I'm going to cite it. That doesn't mean I'm going to do anything other than perhaps find some information in there that's going to help me resolve the issue I have in a particular case. So well, I, I think it is helpful. Well, why don't we just instead change to say, in addition, general overhead has been found in some bankruptcy cases to be not recoverable. Oh, I don't have a problem. I think really? I don't have a problem with the language as is. 
I'm just saying I don't have a problem with that. I think it is helpful. Obviously, everybody has whatever opinion and we're gonna decide it, but uh, I don't think anything else is needed. I think the most efficient deal with uh, Tom Carter is to just have a general statement that the uh, arbitrator might wish to consider the reasoning in Tom Carter regarding what constitutes general overhead. Yeah, that's, that's a good suggestion. Um, Clark's hand was up again, Joel. I, I, it's not, a, I mean, we cite bankruptcy opinions in a lot of, of the advisories, including, I, I seem to remember the reasonable, the reasonable fees or bill padding. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not uncommon to do that. In fact, I, I think there's a, you, you know, there's a, a lot of billing and cost analysis in those cases that's very helpful fee arbitration. So yeah. I, I don't think there's anything wrong. I like the it. way that Roy suggested it, you know, sort of, um, yeah. it may be helpful in your analysis and yeah. decide it. Yes. Not the case, but the reasoning in the case. Right, right. Yeah. So, Joel, do you got that? Uh, yeah, I've got it. But I, I also want to point out, I, I was just informed by an eminent attorney's fees expert who testified recently okay. that... Um, and his name is Joel Mark. No. <laughs> <laughs> You're fishing You're too hard. Your <laughs> no. The... the the point is this, is that we all the time, when you give reasonable value opinions um, as an expert, and Mike was sharing with me that he did recently as well, is you do look to cases that do not involve direct attorney-client disputes. You look at uh, fee shifting. What does a court consider to be reasonable to shift from one pot, one side to the other? And you'll find references like this. And Tom Carter is one of them. And it's well-reasoned, in my view. So I don't think we should shy away from giving it a but C. Yeah, I agree. This is a but C. All right. Um, any other comments on 40? All right, 41. You want a real nit? Sure, you're, you're the nit guy. Uh, such charges may be properly billed. Okay, where are you first? Uh, second paragraph. Messenger services? Messenger services. Such charges may be properly billed, I think is better English than billed properly. Okay. May properly be billed? May, may be properly billed. Yeah, may be properly Just switching yeah. those two words. I don't like properly. Why, why, why do we need properly? I, <laughs> Unless it's build, I, yeah. I, I'm less yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe oh, build that. Then, then we don't have to call up my old English teacher. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I don't use passive voice, but a lot of people here do. So. Yeah. All right. Um, anything else? Okay. Anything else on uh, 41? Ken? Ken, I'm warning you, this is your last chance. Yeah, not yeah, bringing this back again. Yeah. Well, well I mean, other than the stuff we discussed last time, the photocopying one was going to be <laughs> No, there's redone. no others that we discussed. It's not on. There's a, we, we were going to redo the photocopying along with what we had earlier and soften it up and talk about the various factors. That's on the thing that I sent to you and to Isabel. Was your note from last week. You guys, you guys are like okay, I'll look forward to receiving your proposed it. revision in the next week or so. <laughs> so, well, Ken, you. send your... We have it. He told me not to put that version in the... All right, so Ken's going to send it off to Joel right now. I have it in an email. Before we all forget. Yeah. No, exactly. <laughs> so are we going and, to... And, and we're, not, we're here in September going deja vu. <laughs> if I remember. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um... Anything on 42, the last page? Well, 41. 41? Uh, yeah, the, the second paragraph, messenger services. I made a mention last time about in-house messenger services. Whether you build it out at your expense cost or some higher premium, that, that's something that comes up quite frequently with some of the bigger firms or medium firms in Los Angeles. You know, they have uh, uh, in-house people that run the 
yeah, they run across the street and they charge $100 a drop where, you know, you have the attorney services that just charge a flat monthly fee for everything. Um, so whether or not we take a stand on that. I think we leave it up to the arbitrator that's hearing the case. For which case? The, we leave it to the arbitrator if it's an issue. So it's a factual determination? Yeah, exactly. And do we um, do Because it all depends on the amount. If the, if the in-house person is five bucks, uh, you know, th then, it's, then it sounds like a reasonable charge. Right. You know, if it's $500. So it all depends. Do, do we do we cite to the ABA? Because I didn't find anything in California. There's the ABA opinion says on those types of costs, the firm can attach a uh, a uh, reasonable uh, profit. Yeah, it says this charges may. Well, I, I can't track this change, but however, said charges may not be reasonable. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> They may not be reasonable. It may they, not be unreasonable. No, no, may not be I, I reasonable know. when they arise out of the attorney's procrastination or inattention. You can pass on a cost for your uh, dilatory mm -hmm. practice to your yeah. clients. That that sentence need to, needs to be reworked. But that does have a, you know, that there is some kind of um, uh, weighing that goes on there. You know, you should have you should have gotten that to the courthouse sooner. The reason I didn't get it to the courthouse is because you didn't tell me but the certain not, information. But that's not there. what that sentence says. Yeah. It's from the attorney's procrastination or inattention. It's not. I'm waiting for you, and you didn't get me the stuff I needed. No, 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 but that's, in other words, it, I'm not going to discuss when they're reasonable because it was the fault of the client. That's, that's obvious. This, the attorney's going to say, hey, I, I laid out all these things, and a client may say, I'm not going to pay for that because you were a procrastinator, period. Now, if the lawyer says, well, my defense to that is, that it wasn't my procrastination that was the cause, then you don't fit into that set. Correct. Yeah. So I don't need, I don't need, you can't, you don't have to make the case on both sides of every issue here. Oh, no, that's not what I was saying. Well, that's what Annie was saying. saying. Oh, okay, yeah. That's not what I was saying either. <laughs> we all agree with you, Joel. <laughs> yeah. No, we do. You're 100% you're so, so good sir. Kumbaya has broken out. Okay. Yes. <laughs> good sir. <laughs> all right. Um, now, just for the record, Ken Bacon has just sent you his email that has his changes in it. Just for the record, he didn't just send it. He sent it before, but I can send it again. Do you want to share that with me as well, or is that prohibited? Uh, I don't know whether I did or didn't. Let me see. So that's the trouble. I got nothing. We're, We're in a meeting, so there's no BK violation. We're in a meeting. <laughs> I will. Forward that to both of you. Thank you. All right. Um, any comments on page 42, the last page of the draft? Did we change C to B on page 40? 40? Not yet, but I will. <laughs> Wait a minute. Yes. Instead of section C, it's section B now. You mean that? Took out A. Okay. <laughs> All right. No changes um, on forty-two. So um, we're going to bring this back <coughs> September. Joel's going to be the word processing machine. <laughs> He's going to look at Ken's email comments and come up with a draft that we're all going to review and approve in September. Well, so we can avoid I, the statute of limitations on this one. I, I'd like to make some more comments. <laughs> you want to bring more comments? Yes. I, I don't know if they're addressed in uh, Ken's notes. Okay. 
So I mean, I, I can. Wait are these just over overreaching comments, or? <coughs> yes, are they're, they're, for me, they're always overreaching. Or are we looking at a specific uh, page with with language? Well, I, I actually have it on my computer. I I um, I added them to a draft. I think I sent to Isabel at one point. That may have been sent to Ken and Joel. I'm not sure how I did it. Maybe you could send them again. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, because that would be helpful and we'll put it all in one file. Yeah. Exactly. But if you can, yeah, if you can send me whatever version you guys are working off of, I can make them again, cut and paste. Or you can send us your comments as yeah, you have them. Okay. If you, if you and we'll throw it, them yes. into the, the revision. Got it. Okay, does that sound like a plan, Joel? Whatever. Oh, no. Ring my endorsement. That's my least favorite word in the world. Yeah. It's the tone, this is, not the word. Th this has now become the second worst nightmare that I've ever had on this committee. So. Really? First is what I joined. What's the first? <laughs> yeah, really. Wager. Wager? Oh, okay. that, took, that took a hearing and an argument with Ram. Oh, look how well it took off. It worked out. There. All right, all right. Wasn't that your ex-partner? Just send it to me. I, I think we're making in a progress, week or though. something, okay? All right. Um, so I think it's the last item on the agenda. Um, it's the Western San Bernardino mm. County Bar Association. Um, their proposed rules. Oh, and Roy and Joel did a really good um, memo on comments. And what I took from their comments was. These rules don't comply with the minimum standards a lot. <laughs> so um, I'll leave it up to you guys how you want to present this. Um, have, you, have you all had a dialogue with um, anybody at San Bernardino? No. No. Do you think it would be helpful to go through the comments and then, um, then take them back to whoever sent these to us? Um, because it's almost like a, a, a big rewrite. Okay, well. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, whoever wants to present it. I don't know about Joe, but I don't like them. <laughs> I don't like these rules. No, did, did you get my sense I like them? Yeah. Okay. Number one, a, cu a couple of, the reason that I kind of did it the way I did it is that, number one, if they want to change a rule or something, and they can suggest it, and I think we did a pretty good job of highlighting where they went too far astray. <coughs> but secondly, and, and maybe if this now has changed because of staffing or whatever, normally it was the uh, our uh, state bar liaison who would discuss this with these people uh, at the local level, and that arose out of the, uh, the almost civil war we had about maybe 15 or 20 years ago with the Orange County Bar Association where they Oh, yeah. Didn't appreciate the meddling they got or perceived to get from this committee. So. Well, because they're much more ethical lawyers than anywhere else in the state. Yes. Well, that's what they said. I know. It won't bother well, that's what they said. No, I, w I, wouldn't, I wouldn't disbelieve that. Okay. So if, if you want one of us I to do that. I think they see from the union. No, I will definitely communicate with the, my contact that was from the San yeah. you know, and I can attach your, sorry. Yeah. I can uh, get back in contact with the staff person at Western San Bernardino and attach the summary of the two of you's concerns. Yeah. Um, she, she already has a copy of the model rules, so she knows what the CMFA expects out of proposed rules. Um, I think she has an attorney working on this. Uh, it might be like their local chair or, or whatever their equivalent is. So um, I can voice the concerns of the committee to them and have them retool them and maybe come back for, for uh, re-evaluation after they made edits, if they decide to make yeah, any edits. Yeah. Do you want me to do that? I can definitely do that. It's, it's probably it, easier yeah. for me to do that than... Right, if they agree yeah. to all these things, that's fine. But mm -hmm. you've got to I emphasize to them or point out to them that if they have any serious deviations, deviations. from the model rules, mm -hmm. they're not going to get approved. Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll stress that to them. Uh, it's two layers of approval to us and as well as the board. There, there are one and maybe two points that Joel and I weren't in complete agreement on. Yeah. And I think if we go down your memo, respect, I think that would be helpful to get everybody's comments yeah, and then I, think I agree that 
just there ask, to be a ask them to explain why they've chosen the route they have. You know, where where Joel and I are in complete agreement, uh, there's some reason that they've gone the route they have that one of us agrees with and the other one doesn't. Mm -hmm. What is that reason? Okay. Well, we could work through that here today. Then we have a consensus that we can bring back. That this is, this is, um, and I don't know if you can pull out those ones where you guys yeah, I think the, the way the way Isabel has listed them, I think mean, it's very easy to see uh, the one or two places that we are completely yeah. agreement on. So why don't you start out the discussion, Roy, with, with the one where the first one where you guys agree? Well, if it's not one point four, I'd like to I, I thought eleven point one where they're they're playing with venue was really bad. But but if we're going to go down, yeah, yeah that, that's that's I'll let you I'll let you um, lead the discussion here. Page ninety. Comments um, where Roy like page 82, yeah. 83, and 84. Well, specifically, page 90 is where our comments on Rule 11.1 is. That's probably the biggest area of lack of complete agreement. Uh, we're talking about the client's residence as a basis for jurisdiction. And, uh, you know, my thinking is. Client's residence is not an appropriate basis. It, it's never a venue. Yeah. That, that, and it should the, just be the, the, the plaintiff's the, residence isn't venue in ex the exactly. Exactly. No, but our, our our we have a specific venue. It's um, attorney has offices, substantial services performed, and what's yeah. the third one? It was, should just mimic that. Yeah. The the model rules are right on. Yeah. And uh, they've gone, uh, they, they've tossed the model rules in the trash can with respect to this particular area. Well, they added they added one additional provision, is what they did. Yeah, it's, that's fact, you have to read it in context. It says two of the factors. Yeah. So it's the client can reside in the county plus the, the work cases work. either in the county or the the attorney had an office in the county when he provided the services. It, so it, it take, to take up your uh, thing, let's say I hire, um, I live in, in the county and I hire an attorney in the county to do work for me in a case that's venued in Shasta. And he's gotta go fly up to Shasta to do it. And I've got a fee dispute arising out of that. I should be able to do that in San Bernardino. That's what you're saying. Because you live there. And so does the and so does the attorney. The, the contract was entered into in San Bernardino, and he's got a, a presence there. I shouldn't have to go where the services are being rendered, Shasta, in order to address my fee dispute. Venue should be per the model rules. And this is not venue. This is jurisdiction. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, technically, it's the situs. So venue. They've got it set off with a semicolon, so it's, it's an independent ground that they're, you know, they're I think you're reading a lot into that semicolon. Yeah, it, it, it says uh, two of the two of the following provisions have to be satisfied. So I, I think um, we just have to follow venue per the minimum standard. Residence is never, client's residence is, the client's residence is never a factor. Because like I said, to, to, I could live in Wyoming. Exactly. That's not, that's not, so the bar is going to go. <laughs> but that's not what this says. This says the within, client resides in San Bernardino I, within yeah, that county. I, I think the bar, it goes with It doesn't matter where plaintiff's residence is never a factor. I feel like some clients do to take into consideration uh, along with another property. I understand. I, I, we're just on these rules. Maybe we have to. I recall several cases when I was presiding arbitrator where it was a situation, client is in 
Sacramento, and attorney is in Los Angeles. Attorney seeks out client. Does clients, clients, attorney is the one who signs up the client sitting at home in the rocking chair. I'm going to do the estate plan or whatever. Attorney goes back to the office, performs all the services there in Los Angeles. But the work product ends up in Sacramento. And now the attorney is saying, uh-uh, you got to get out of your rocking chair. you got to come to Los Angeles, even though I came up here to sign you up. you got to come to Los Angeles to do this business. That to me was unfair, and I always changed the venue to the Rocking. Well, then maybe you would go under substantial services performed in Sacramento. Yeah. That's how but you, you wouldn't that. say yeah. the basis of venue is because the plaintiff is sitting in a rocking chair in Sacramento. You just, you just fit your facts into. But it is a factor. Yes. Yeah. I always felt it was, anyway. Do we have a problem with them expanding the venue? Yeah, to, to plaintiff's residence, because it doesn't meet the minimum you? standard. Uh, it alters the minimum, minimum standard. standard. Because like Anna Heed said, you could be in New York, you know? The model rule is not in the minimum I mean the model rule. Yeah, so, so it still requires two of the factors. Right. right. So the mere fact that they're in New York doesn't mean that's the go with that. It has to have two of the factors. Right. So, I'm, I'm just so, so I think on that we say absolutely get rid of resides and plaintiff resides or client resides in San Bernardino County. But they're just trying to they serve want their to client to uh, San Bernardino right. County. Right. Okay. okay. And the only other area that I think Joel and I weren't in pretty much agreement on is uh, their rule 40.4, which so do you have direction on that so we can... Well, 40.4 doesn't have a, 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 a... There is no 40.4 there is no 40. 40. in the model rules. But this one says the hearing panel... Have we, got, have we skipped to another section now? Mm -hmm. no, 40.4. Okay. I just want to make sure that we have direction. Is someone going to prepare uh, another memo that says how the committee considers 11.1. Well, Maybe we can just revise the one that we've got here. Yeah. So who's going to be doing that? Uh, Who wrote the first one? Uh, Who prepared the July 13th, uh, 1991 memo? 92 memo? 92. Who prepared board packet 90 through 90? Oh, I just do. compiled the review and done Okay. <laughs> So if you have it on your system, if you can revise 11.1 and so there's consensus that they have to follow the model or okay. the model rule. And yeah. not uh, use client's residence. Yeah. Right. Okay, but there's at least two bar situations right now that use it. So and that would probably be um, another discussion. Okay. Because I'm just referring to the But have we ever voted on that? Do you want to vote? Yeah, I, I mean, I, uh, okay. I, if, if it is not, if it doesn't contradict the motion. Right, I'll make it a motion that, well, first of all, that the client's residence within a county may be a factor which may be weighed to determine jurisdiction venue. I'll second that. Well, just for, discussion. Just for purposes of discussion. Can I? So, so basically, you're getting rid this is my discussion. You're getting rid of the, the model rules. I'm not Nick. getting rid of the model rules. I, you're I, adding to the model rules. I'm not. I, the model rules are what they are. The, the uh, local bar associations do not have to adopt the model rules. They just okay, can't have. They just can't have things contrary to the model rules. Can, can I propose a friendly amendment? Sure. And and make your motion applicable only to the matter at hand, which is. The San Bernardino, you know, Western San Bernardino. That's the only thing that's on our agenda. Yeah. Yes. We can only discuss things on our agenda. Okay. And I'll reset the rules. So, what was your friendly amendment? That, that we limited it to San Bernardino. Oh, right. Yeah, to the matter we're addressing, which right. is the language in Rule 11.1 .1 of, of the Western San Bernardino County proposed uh, fee arbitration. I, I think you massively expand 
venue when you allow the plaintiffs or the client's residence to be a factor. Because as Anna and he pointed out, they could be living, let's expand it beyond the United States in Singapore. That could be your, yeah. your legal residence. Yeah. Has to take you open up a Pandora's yeah. box, a can of worms, whatever you want to call it, when you allow that as a factor. I'm just going through, you know, that, that extreme example, just following up on Joel. Um, and I'm just quickly. But I'm, I'm trying uh, to grandma, illustrate a factual scenario. No you got grandma sitting in, in Sacramento on her rocking chair. And she's got a property in Los Angeles. And she's got to do something with it. An attorney knows, reaches after her gets the contract signed, does all of the work, everything in Los Angeles, and now there's a fee dispute. Are you going to force grandma to go down there? Yep. Even you are? Yep. I don't, I mean, <laughs> think about it. I don't think we have enough facts. Who's so, making money? Where is the burden? The burden is on the attorney that he's done everything right. He's reaching much, out to client. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, there are provisions for that. I mean, grandma could appear by phone or, yeah. or the other one. Right, and you can you can use those facts to come to the conclusion that substantial services in preparing estate planning documents occurred in Sacramento. She probably signed them. I mean, it's so fact specific. But what you're doing is you're focusing on the model rules. What I am saying is is that this additional factor gives the arbitrator the ability or the, the the program administrator whoever is going to have to do this jurisdiction yeah. call. No, um, I, I understand your point. I just have all right. So I, I, I won't no. restate it. Yeah. I'm not focusing on the rule. I'm focusing on the reason for the rule. Yeah. Okay. And that's why you don't have venue in a regular civil case right. where the plaintiff resides. Exactly. Keep keep in mind that 6200D trumps the minimum standards and the model rules, and it says that the committee designated by the board shall ensure that local program rules provide for a fair, impartial, and speedy hearing and award. Now, if getting grandma under the, the circumstances that I faced in that case, out of the chair, to fly to Los Angeles with her oxygen bottle, to take care of the whole hearing, that <laughs> seems to me to be terribly unfair. Right, and that's why I would say substantial services were performed in Sacramento. So, so. I... So I think we need to um, uh, take a vote on this one. Um, so next motion is to include the plaintiff's residence um, as, as a ground for only for this ground for venue for San Bernardino County rules. Yes. All in favor of that, raise your hand. Hold on, Nick, Joel, and Fish. That's it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can the PA vote? Yeah, vote. <laughs> all right, I'll, I'll post. All right. Did everybody vote? Okay. Hold on, who's no? I did not vote. Okay, so I, I have Anna Heed, Carol is no, yeah, vote, yeah. George is no, Lee Epstein. Lee Epstein. Lee Epstein. Oh, Lee Epstein. Okay, uh, Pat. Lee Epstein. We got to bring in Mike Pence Hold to break on. the vote. Because <laughs> <laughs> we have abstainers. Lee, Lee's abstain? All right, Lee abstain. Lorraine is no. Leroy is no. Okay. So he has a majority either way? Uh, yeah, so it's four for yes, and the rest is no, and there's only 13 members here today. No, there were three abstainers. Oh. But let's get the no vote, because we need the no vote. Yeah. Okay. So three abstainers. No, but you said the rest was. Yeah, so uh, for no, I have Anahid, Carol, George, Pat. No, Carol abstained. No, Carol abstained. Carol right. abstained? You need so seven. Lee abstained too? You need too? seven to carry she, it either way. They don't care about grandma. <laughs> <laughs> you need seven to carry it either way or it's a deadlock. Okay, the problem is I have a lot of people out today. Okay, so Ken, uh, sorry. So Ken is yes, Anahid is no, Carol abstained, George is no, Michael is yes. Pat is no, Joel is yes, John is no, Nick is yes, Clark is no, Lee abstain, Lorraine is no, Roy is no. So how many no's have it. The no's have it. Seven. Okay, seven no's. One, two, three, four yeses.
No, but no. what's the power of entry rule on where, where you can put you with abstentions? Well, seven, seven out of 13 is a majority no. Yes. Yes. You subtract majority. the abstentions for the majority? No. Majority. And there's 13 people here, two okay. so you have seven no's. so it's out of 11. So seven, four. No. The motion does not carry. Well, no, that's not, we had three abstentions. Two. two. If you had 13. Minus no, two is 11. I thought the three three How many lawyers does it take to figure yeah. out a vote? A majority. majority. More than we have in this room. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> Seven is a majority. And we're on video No. Okay. The chair determines the motion does not carry. Okay. So the recommend or the uh, committee position is not to use all the Yeah. Well, all right, moving on. No. There's no no. No, no I no. recall. No, no, Somewhere, no. when I was a parliamentarian for a nationwide organization, back in the dark ages, that you you've got to do something with extensions when you talk about a majority vote. You mean abstentions? Abstentions. Okay. Sorry. Did I say extensions? Yeah. Pen, yeah. Pen, okay. pen, 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 roll, those are different. Pen, you put those in your hair. Or something. It wouldn't make a difference. No, no. Pending a roll review. Right. I object the to the result carry. announced by the chair. Absent research into the question of yeah. how abstentions are to be counted on the parliamentary yeses? procedure. Okay, let's see. Well, even, even if we counted them as yeses or as noes or yeses, it'd still be seven six. So it wouldn't change anything. Yeah. If we add them to the no, then it's nine four. So either well, way, still either way it's the same result. <laughs> right? How do you treat an abstention? Is it a yes or a no? Um, moving right along. Roy, any other yeah, sections that yeah. you want to highlight for us? 40.4, which is unique to, the, to their rules. The hearing panel shall either deny the application or correct the award in writing signed by the arbitrators. Uh, first of all, I, I'm not sure what they mean by the application, but uh, I don't think that the arbitrators have the jurisdiction to uh, so-called correct the award. Not after commencement of a judicial proceeding. Before the award is served. 30 days. You exactly. Have I've, I've, I've gotten within that 30-day period. But, a, but amendment is Like a, a math error, they come back and they go, yeah. fix the math error. Well, when they uh, talk about correction of the award, to me that is an award has been made and now we're going to change it in some respect. Yeah. You can do that yeah. within that With, 30 within day 30 day. Yeah. Correction limits on what you can well, do and correcting it, but yes. you can do And that's all, that's all statutory. It's in the yeah. BMP. Well, then, then, it, then the last sentence needs to be amended. It, it says jurisdiction to amend or supplement the award expires upon entry of judgment. That implies that there has been a a non-binding exactly. award which has been attacked in court and has gone to judgment. Well, uh, amending is different than correcting. And I think there is a case that deals with amending, amending and the cutting off of yes. jurisdiction, Carton versus Greta or something yeah. like that. No, but the the point point in the first sentence they talk about correct, in the second talk, sentence they talk about amend. So There's two separate acts. Yeah. It, the, the whole subsection to oh. me just is garbage. Well, yeah. you know, we're they're, they're mixing up theories, number one. And then if they say that it could be done after the commencement, that's absolutely wrong. Yeah. Don't. Well, the point I made, and I never followed up to see, but we have an arbitrator advisory on this question. Mm -hmm. We just thought to make sure it's consistent with the arbitrator advisory. Because I do recall something about you can, the arbitrators can correct it until it. <coughs> Under certain circumstances, until it's confirmed, right? Yeah. Exactly. Right. So, we ought to dig that out and change it. Yeah, the problem there too. There, the first part, the, the forty-one, two, and point three, track the model rule, but they changed the heading. Theirs just says correction <coughs> of award by hearing panel. The model rule says correction or amendment. No, they because they are the two different things. No. That's why. I think Roy's right. It's confusing because they've eliminated <coughs> the, the heading part that deals with both correction and amendment. Why don't they we probably just tell don't know them the difference. If they want 40.4, yeah, give us an explanation of what it means and 
uh, what their authority is. And why they're deviating from the model rules. Right. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Did they have a I think it's incorrect. I think actually the model the is much clearer. Yeah, to show it is correct. The model rules are okay. Because they talk about uh, correction in, for the first two sections, and then they talk about amendment in 40.3. Yeah. So I think on that, we just say you got to follow the model rules that you, you've tweaked them, and in doing so, you've created you yeah, know, I think wrong right. concepts. Do you think we should throw in the advisory in the mix? I, you know, I don't think the advisory differs from the model rule. I think that just would complicate it. it it's their burden to show us why why it's a good idea to include that. Yeah. Yeah. Their their forty point two is it, um, they have again included amendment in a section which we talk about correction yeah. in the model. So I think they have just just the sort of um, intermingled the two yeah. separate concepts. So on 40.2 and 40.4, the message back is follow, like follow the model rule. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't tinker with something you don't know about. <laughs> Pretty much, other, other than that, I think Joel and I are in 99.7% agree on that kind of thing. Okay. So, um, it's 2014-01. What's your advice? So Isabel will take all the comments back to the powers that be at West San Bernardino and we're requesting um, a revised draft. Can we can't approve one. Okay. All right, I believe we're done with um, all the items under uh, business. Um, it's not on the agenda, but I'm just going to throw it out. Any any new business, anything that anybody has a yearning to attach as an agenda item to for our <laughs> September meeting? So I think what we're taking uh, back on September are finalized arbitration advisories on interest. Costs, West San Bernardino rules, combined revised filing fee and mediation rules for San Mateo, and then get some structure on um, arbitrator quality control. Should we wait, um, Carol and Roy? To actually have the um, new rules come out in November to start working on that, or do you think I we can wait because it's going to be quite a big job? It looks like just yeah. because when we were talking about it, this is what we discussed, and um, we probably will want to make some tweaks to the form arbitration and form fee agreements that the committee did that are on the state bar's website, um, and then. Probably we'll need to revise the training to the extent it references the old rules. So we have basic now and advanced. And then um, to try to revise our arbitration advisories to reference the correct rules. And it's not that big of a job conceptually. It's not too bad to change the numbers. But in many cases, the actual wording of the rule and the content of the rule has changed in some cases. So if we're going to go through and do all of that, that may take quite a, quite a bit of work. So I would go ahead and start. And what we discussed was I was going to tackle a first draft on the form fee agreements and the training. And then Roy is going to do a first draft on the advisories and then the switch, um, you know, work product and, and trade it back. and review what the other one is done. So I don't know how much we'll even get done by November 1, but it does seem to make sense to start it. Yeah. yeah. I think the rule that we, we cite mostly um, in our materials is 4200 and conscionability. And I, I actually did the Daily Journal article on, you know, 
the change, and it, it didn't materially change. They kept the actual discipline part of the rule, which the model rules didn't have. So you can come into the discipline side of the equation if you charge an unconscionable fee. But and then they re tweak the eleven factors. I think they're thirteen factors now. But that's the one we cite um, throughout our materials. Well, and then uh, the new rule one point fifteen. Yeah. Has the flat you, fee. Yes, has the flat fee language that is optional for you to put in to your fee agreement and get your client's consent to not put the money in the trust account. Right. That's one thing I think we were going to. So wanna, the Brownski case is basically yeah. out the window. It's. I think that's. Your money question. has to go into trust unless you have the language from that um, new rule uh, approved by your client in the fee agreement. Right. Yeah. So that's where we have to tie it into the fee agreement. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, certain parts of our um, training do touch upon other rules. And so we're just going to want to make sure that we have the correct references in there and that nothing has changed substantively on those other rules that are referenced. Right. I think um, when Ken and I were working on the uh, fee agreements, we have a joint disclosure of standalone form. So three, 300 and 310, all that has to be revised. Yeah, we, we need the time. We need the time that we get by starting now. To no, exactly. Want to be done by the November. Yeah, it's it's it was a Herculean task to revise the fee agreements and all the other various uh, options. We have various optional clauses, the joint disclosure. Um, that took us, you know, almost uh, a year and a half before we were ready to finalize them and put them on the website. But they hadn't been revised for 19 years or 20 years. So. It was time. Well, maybe Carol and I will change that. Well, we could probably beat 19 years with anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least you should try. Yeah. Those, are, those have been vetted, you know, uh, lots, lots, of, uh, lots of conference calls. Yeah. We've got input from the Joanne Mendoza. I'm going to try very hard to account this term. I'm sorry, there's two people talking. I'm going to have all arbitration advisors being advised for these sections. So it's 2018-1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10. Good question. It's going to look like we've been working really hard. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, historically, if, it, if any change was made, it has a new number. That's right. Although now I, I no, take that back, 1993, reasonable yeah, fees, we because that's been cited in cases. So. Um, well, we're, we're only changing the numbers of rules that are substantially the same. Uh, it seems to me we can just amend advisory, you know, 11, 2011.6 or, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. Just do a notation that this, the, the sites were updated to reflect the new rules affected the yeah. first. Okay. All right. Does anybody have any agenda item they want on September? Any, any thoughts? All right. It is now 209. No, one more thing. Oh. I'll prepare a flyer for the advanced training and then we'll send it out to uh, active San Diego attorneys as well as give it to San Diego to distribute to their membership. The question is about how that's um, San Luis Obispo, do we have any um, They never got back to me. I sent an email to their chair um, asking if he was able to speak with their board of trustees to see if they wanted to go forward with it. The issue is they didn't want a three hour training. They wanted one hour of ethics, and we can't separate that from right. the rest of the curriculum. So I think that gave him a pause, but um, I haven't heard back from him at all. Uh, we do have a new training on the calendar for Bakersfield, and then we had a training at Alameda um, that was very well attended. We already received several applications. So hopefully we'll get some new arbitrators because there was only one person who currently hears the arbitrations who attended. So everybody was new, which is really good. Um, we're hoping to get some new recruits out of that. And some lay arbitrators too. Right? 
Yeah, we received an application from a lay arbitrator, um, so we did get some interest. Um, there were some genuine, you know, questions I thought, and there was a good discussion with some of the attendees. So, thanks, George, John, and Clark for doing that. So, if you want to add anything on to your oh staff my report, my staff report, they um, sort of got hijacked yeah. by appendix I. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> Last time I was going to look into whether or not we could present a program at the California Lawyers, uh, is it a CLA? The section, the new right. section. Right, so the answer is no, because they booked a smaller venue and they had to cut off some of their own programs, so it's only open to CLA programs. So outside, um, outside programs are not allowed this year, but they're hoping next year that they'll book a larger venue so that they can include more programs, including their own programs. What can hold it in the front for? Um, is that the same hotel that they had last year, and you attended it? Yeah, is that, is that, um, is that high end out on, on Mission Bay? Yeah. yeah, I don't know. That's what they got a smaller conference room. Yeah. 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 I mean, they had an area, and Let's they, they were pretty congested there. Okay. Well attended. Uh, it's not open to uh, non-CLA programs this year, so maybe next year. Right, yeah. okay. yes, no stats? No stats? Well, no, are we batting a thousand? <laughs> <laughs> well, I filed a motion earlier this week, so that's pending. Um, I think the attorneys are no-show, though. She didn't pay her dues, she didn't report MCLA, so I'm mean, not really expecting anything on that, but that's pending. Oh, and you should watch the uh, board meeting next week because they'll be Richard will be giving his uh, oral report on the status. Could you, so. could you send us an email dash with the basic title of that in the sure. subline? Yeah. So is the, so is the September meeting our our last meeting for this year? Yes, or? it's the end of the committee year. Okay. Um, oh, we don't have anything scheduled yet because we don't know seven. what's going yeah. to happen. Uh, yeah. So. Okay. Yeah, and I was thinking um, of, well, it's going to be my last meeting, so um, last year we had sort of a cocktail party at the hotel across the street, so I'm going to send out a, a, a invite to all of you, so if you want to just um, plan your travel plans, there's this really cool um, second floor rooftop, they call it rooftop, it's not really on the roof. but they since, um, uh, a boutique hotel took over the um, hotel that was there. It's called Hotel Republic, and it, at, at least on their website, they revamped the um, bar. It looks really, really cool. So, um, you know, join me for drinks and hors d'oeuvres um, after our meeting on the 14th. So we are adjourned. Okay. Early. Joel. Recognizing that we've adjourned, can we have a final report from the baseball subcommittee? Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. This is off the record. Where? No. Yeah, uh, we're, 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 we're,